Good morning, all. We're here for a hearing in the matter CA002-2023 before Chief Justice Tunzaki Azmi, Justice Michael Black, and His Excellency Justice Shamlan Al Sawalhi. The appellate is represented by Charles Russell Speechley's LLP. Lead counsel is Andrew Spink, KC. Um, junior counsel is Justina Stewart. The first respondent is represented by KBH Limited. Lead counsel is Mr. Richard Hill, KC. Junior counsel is Ms. Bushra Ahmed. The second respondent is represented by Kemp, LLP. Lead counsel is Brian Kotick and Salah Matu. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everybody. Uh, as you all may be aware, this is uh, the maiden city of this court today. First time this court will be being utilized. So we should all be proud. We are on record. Uh, we'll be historically remembered as being the first panel of judges as well as counsel appearing before the court in this brand new courtroom. But if you find the temperature is not working well, then the, we have technicians waiting the back there because this morning we're having some problem with, with the technician, the, the, the egg on or something. Anyway, so yes, Mr. Spink. Mr. Ping, Spink, Mr. Spink. Thank you. Can can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, because is the speaker on? Is the here? Is the speaker on? Because when you were saying something just now, uh, Aisha, I didn't quite hear you well. You know. This means it's on. If you need to. This this is mute. Mute is red. Oh. Red is on. Green is off. Yes, Mr. Spin. Thank you. Okay, before we go on the, the hearing, can we get our uh, housekeeping rules issued? Uh, you are going to take the whole day today? Yes. That it? And then the respondent will take the whole day tomorrow? Uh, all that, well, I think where we got, uh, uh, she just, where we got to, I think, is that we would have just seven and a half hours for Mr. Spink, mm -hmm. and then seven and a half hours for <coughs> us two sets of defendants combined. Mm. So obviously he will have to allocate his seven and a half between opening and reply, and we will have to allocate our seven and a half between us. <clears throat> okay. Now, I want to make a special request. My, I have to leave the hotel at 5 p.m. on the Wednesday. My flight is, I think, 9 a.m., 8 p.m. or something like that. So I would be most appreciative if we could and well before 4 p.m. on on Wednesday, so I've got to rush back to the hotel and I catch a, catch a, my, my taxi by 5 p.m. Is that all right? That, that's the definition of a hard deadline for us. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's non-negotiable and non-negotiable. Uh, I understand hard that. deadline. I uh, don't mind. I don't mind. I'm sure my judges friends uh, don't mind sitting a bit longer today and tomorrow, or starting early on the Wednesday, yes. but we have to stop well before 4 o'clock. That's a Wednesday. very helpful indication. Yes. That if you want to sit, I have no problem. I'm staying at uh, Ritz Carlton, so you want to start at 9 o'clock, fine with me. I don't know about Judge uh, Shamblan or Mr. Justice Black. I'm Black very Wednesday. happy to start early or sit late. Yeah. My respectful submission would be that we see how we go today yes. up to the normal court time of, I believe, 4 p.m., and then we uh, perhaps anticipate starting early tomorrow morning. Good. And perhaps again on Wednesday. No harm. I think that would be a, a would, 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 would enable okay. us to um, uh, take stock at four o'clock and okay. see how we go. So, uh, we're going and to need, I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, go on. We're, we're going to need, I think, the full 15 hours uh, that we have in sitting time. Uh, it's tight. Um, I we, we had some discussions about timing. Um, the main point that we uh, have agreed is that we should I should have 50% of the time, and the defendant should combine. Um, I'm going to be doing some work in my um, first part of my submissions that might be thought of as relatively neutral opening, taking the court to certain documents and so on. Um, but I will try and accommodate that within the, the, the time that... that I think the facts are quite simple. 
the inferences from the facts is another set of issue. You know, yes. How do we infer from what actually has taken place? Precisely. Uh, secondly, uh, when what time do we break this morning? Uh, just, just do you, you, do you, what you're going to be on your feet for two and a half hours or two hours? Well, or what? if we could have a five minute break, um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, I mean, let, 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 let indicate it, to us it's when, you, when you have to want, want to have a break. Yeah. Just let let us know. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to proceed right through. But, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, I think we are, we are all people. A break. <laughs> we need. A break. Would be <laughs> okay. Um, yes. In which case, I'll 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 I'll, I'll, I'll make a start. Yes, please. If I may. Yes. Um, there is uh, one other item of housekeeping. Yes. If, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciate that the court is not keen on hard copy documents, but for now, because there's been a slight problem loading uh, two documents onto the system, mm -hmm. may I provide hard copies of those sure, documents? Sure, no problem. I have no problem with that. Um, are, are those the documents that you filed last night? Yes. Oh, I have those and so on. Uh, I, I, have an, I have an amended version of one of those documents, which I hope will be helpful to the court. Okay. Um, the, the document I'm referring to is the uh, claimant's list of authorities that appears at uh, section J, tab 57, starting at 15,616. And this version, I hope helpfully, has the bundle page numbers inserted against the paragraphs from each of the authorities that we uh, are, are relying on. And the additional documents that were filed last night, are they uh, agreed, Mr. Hill? Yes, no problem with those. Thank you. Um, is, is, the, is, is the URS is in the bundle? Is there, so there we have so actually, the, 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 other, the other document I should mention is an authority uh, from which we place reliance, URS, uh, against BDW. It, it, it's the very last authority on our list of authorities. Uh, it, it's meant to be at 15566, that's document 56 in section J. Uh, it's on case line, but, but it's not on the PDF if you're working from the PDF. So I, I have it in soft copy. Okay. I, I have a hard copy of that authority if it would be of assistance, but I, I'm not going to trouble uh, Yeah, when you're, when, you're, when you're ready to submit on that, I would okay. be appreciated yeah. if you could give me the copy. <clears throat> so, so as the court is um, uh, well aware, this is an appeal from the decision of Justice Beale uh, it, 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 in this case, in which he found against the claimants uh, and in relation to which uh, we now appeal with a combined permission from Justice Field himself uh, uh, in relation to some of the grounds of appeal uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, court itself in relation to the remaining grounds of appeal. It, it, it is correct to observe some of the grounds are uh, grounds of appeal uh, bringing up only a point of law. Others involve matters of fact as well as law. Uh, and the uh, Court of Appeal considered that all of those grounds should be heard together. There are eight grounds in all. Uh, the uh, final ground, ground eight, is an unusual ground. That's a serious procedural irregularity based upon uh, the late decision of the judge to curtail the ability of counsel for uh, the claimants to cross-examine key witnesses uh, 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 on, on, of the defendants, uh, and that is a ground uh, that is, a, is, is in one sense a standalone ground. Uh, the judge himself gave permission in relation to that ground. Uh, that's something that I anticipate uh, I, I will deal with um, uh, 
uh, uh, tomorrow morning uh, and not today. Um, it is likely that I will also deal tomorrow morning with uh, ground uh, seven, uh, which is uh, fiduciary duty. I shall um, endeavour to get through as much of uh, grounds uh, one uh, to uh, three uh, and uh, six as I can today. And I may leave over until tomorrow some brief submissions on grounds four and five. Ground four is uh, significantly involving fact in relation to negligence, as is ground five. Uh, and what I want to focus on principally today uh, is uh, the uh, appropriate uh, legal structure uh, and, and factual structure for this appeal. Uh, and uh, the main submissions that we will make uh, in relation to uh, the contractual claim and the negligence claim. What I'm going to do, if I may, is to uh, deal initially with uh, some of the uh, basic facts and show you some of the key documents uh, that um, are, are, are of importance uh, in, in this case. Uh, because we submit that although there was a vast amount of evidence in this case, and although even on the appeal, a uh, considerable uh, expanse of territory is covered in relation to the facts, there are some uh, key facts that the judge found, which we wouldn't challenge, and facts that were certainly open to him on the evidence which he didn't expressly find, uh, which when combined uh, would get the appeal home uh, without a significant amount of need in this court to uh, overturn express findings of fact of the court. Uh, in relation to the basic primary facts, we would submit that it's not necessary for the court to overturn any of the express findings made by the court, but the conclusions drawn from some of those facts, uh, for example, in terms of the judge's assessment of uh, reasonableness, which is a uh, assessment, an inference or an assessment made on the basis of primary facts, it is necessary for us to challenge uh, uh, some of those findings, uh, although only to a relatively limited extent. And I'll go through uh, the uh, particular facts that you might want to have in mind that are in, uh, uh, in real issue on this appeal uh, in due course. Um, but first, if I may, I shall uh, uh, deal with my uh, 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 brief, I hope, uh, uh, factual introduction. What I'm going to do after that is I'm going to make some submissions, and it will take you to some underlying uh, references in order to support those su submissions about um, the issue of custody and to a lesser extent escrow, which are terms that have been widely used in this case, although somewhat deprecated by the judge, who considered, we say, a little misguidedly with the greatest of respect to him, that our reference to the defendants as providing custodial services or escrow and or escrow services was, as he put it, grandiose. Um, I'll explain in the section that I'm going to come to uh, after the, the opening section um, why, in our respectful submission, that was a, a misguided view and why, in the world of digital assets, and in particular crypto 
assets, crypto tokens such as Bitcoin, as in this case, uh, which are being uh, sold, transferred, traded, uh, exchanged. Uh, the concept of custody is central. The market cannot function without the provision of custodial services for uh, it, under which a company or a person has, and this is the key word, control over the digital asset, the Bitcoin, the giving of control to a custodian, uh, engages that custodian with a particular duty and is a very important function in this part of the financial market. Uh, Mr. Spin, I must, uh, you must uh, forgive me for being not too experienced in digital matters, you know. When you say custody, custody of what are you, custody, custody of what? Are you talking about the wallet or custody of the Bitcoin no. itself? No, no, uh, the wallet, uh, and we'll come, I'm going to show you some helpful parts of the expert, agreed uh, expert evidence. Mm -hmm. In, in a few minutes, which will, I hope, explain this in more detail. And, and, and so I'll give you, if I may, okay. a brief answer and then come back to this okay. in a little more okay. detail okay. in a while. Yes. But uh, the, uh, there was a tangible, physical um, item at the centre of this case, namely what's called a Trezor wallet, Trezor wallet. Yes. but which is in fact a, like a, a bit like a USB stick, with a screen on it that you can scroll okay. over, which, 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 which gives you instructions and which reads out data, mm. which you can plug into a laptop mm. and which you can configure using a laptop. In this case, the relevant Trezor wallet mm. into which the claimant's Bitcoin were transferred. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the Bitcoin were not transferred. No. Uh, you don't transfer Bitcoin into a Trezor wallet, do you? Well, we, we, it, it, holds, it holds the public and private it key. It holds the public and private key, precisely. I, the you, Bitcoin stay on the blockchain I, at all times. They, they, they stay on the... You're <laughs> I'm having two conversations. Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Uh, and, I, I just listen. And, yeah. and uh, the, that's absolutely right. I, I think colloquially uh, we, we do talk about the transfer of the Bitcoin <coughs> to the wallet. But what, as, as you rightly say, is happening is that the keys to that... But that's the, um, that's the answer to the Chief Justice's question about control, yeah. because the Trezor wallet gives control. It doesn't contain the Bitcoins, but it, it, it contains that which controls the, the Bitcoins, the, 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 the public address and the private key. It enables parties to deal with the Bitcoins on the blockchain. Yes, precisely. So that's, what we, that's why we talk about control rather than possession, but uh, the question is, as you say, whether control amounts to custody or not for the purpose uh, of digital assets. Yes, and the references that I'm going to show you would suggest strongly that co control, in the sense that you have described, uh, is central to the uh, function of a custodian, um, and, and, and an important function. If a person has control in that sense, then um, uh, they may be the full owner, if I can put it that way, of the Bitcoin. But if they have had that control ceded to them through that mechanism, um, uh, certainly as part of a commercial transaction, but potentially in any event, uh, giving rise to a tortious liability, uh, that the, um, uh, the, the control thereby ceded confers on that person a responsibility as a custodian. And in this particular so, case... to compare to your phone, mm -hmm. you have a phone there, and then the, you control using the phone it, it, to control... Well, the, the, a phone is a tangible uh, item. Yes, property. and you can so, have a wallet on a phone. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, a yes, wallet, a wallet, a wallet on, a phone, on a phone, of course. A wallet doesn't have to be a piece of hardware. A wallet doesn't have to be a USB stick, a Trezor wallet of the type used in this case. A wallet could just be 
a, 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 a piece of software somewhere which holds the information required to give the holder control over the Bitcoin. Okay. Um, the so phone itself start, what, is an item of tangible property which you and I can possess in the traditional common yes. law sense and possession in the case of tangible property gives rise to legal rights and obligations. In the digital asset world, because a digital asset like a Bitcoin is not tangible, uh, nor is it a, an item of intangible property. So when you, property when like you were test, referring to the custody, yeah. you were referring to that intangible uh, yes. wallet or whatever it is. That's when you refer to custody. Yeah, That's there's what a you slight, meant. There's a slight complication, Chief Justice, because yeah. a Trezor wallet is designed to give control of um, digital assets offline. So oh, okay. the idea is that you hold the Trezor wallet and you don't have to go uh, online. So the control actually is within the, the Trezor wallet, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. Well, okay. yeah. Never mind. Yeah, let, sorry for disturbing you. Please continue, Mr. Smith. Sorry. I'll, 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 never I'll mind. come back yeah, to yeah, that. Never mind. Yeah, just In, go, just not, not too far away. It's a useful preview and, and it's helpful to for me to gauge um, yeah. what what the respective understandings on yes. the bench are of, of, yeah, of this please. brand new area. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, as you are probably aware, the subject of potential or proposed law reform in the DIFC in order to accommodate this new type of property, digital assets. So we are in, we're in unusual territory. Um, but I, I can tell you what I'm interested in. <coughs> I'm interested in the custody of the Trezor wallet uh, and the intention that that was the sole way of controlling the asset. Just to set the scene, if I may, please. Um, uh, the uh, parties are. Um, I'm going. I'm, I'm just, just, just by by way of assistance. I am from time to time going to refer to Malone Junior's very helpful closing submissions at the trial, which contain. Um, uh, 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 marshaled into one place uh, most of the relevant arguments made to the court uh, below and most of the facts uh, and are a very useful source of information which I commend to the court um, they can be found uh, at um, uh, uh, 8,770 that's the introduction to the closing submissions onwards um, it's important for the court to understand and to distinguish between a number of different um, uh, Huobi uh, entities in this case. Uh, the defendants have repeatedly conflated Huobi Global, Huobi OTC DMCC, which was the first claimant, Huobi OTC DMCC, and Huobi Mina F. ZC, the second claimant. Uh, Huobi Global, or Huobi Group, uh, is a uh, well-known global crypto exchange. Um, the first cl claimant, a DMCC-registered company, uh, was, until the 21st of, uh, uh, September 2021, wholly owned uh, by the second claimant which is in turn owned by a company called Global Pay Holding Limited. Uh, and uh, Huobi Global was party to a joint venture <coughs> agreement involving uh, Mr. Al Ali and Mr. Moed Dava, the co-founder and director of the second claimant. The second claimant was not a party to this agreement. The important point is that the claimants were neither global, they focused on the Middle East, Africa and Turkey, nor were they significant entities. 
the second claimant operated as a cryptocurrency exchange uh, where the parties <coughs> traded crypto assets. So that's crypto to crypto. Uh, the sort of transaction uh, that we're concerned with here, a private transaction between a buyer and a seller, is a different kind of transaction. It doesn't involve an exchange interface, although it can involve a third party, e.g. a custodian, as in, we say in this case. <coughs> the first claimant was in the business of uh, OTC, that's uh, this kind of private transaction, crypto to fiat currency transactions, whereby parties buy and sell crypto assets using fiat currencies. Uh, the key point uh, it, it, it is that uh, in the normal course of their business, uh, neither of the claimants used the kind of cold wallet uh, that uh, was involved in this case, the Trezor wallet that was capable of holding the relevant information and giving control of the Bitcoin offline. Um, uh, the claimant, the first claimant, used what was called the standard model. Uh, if a person wanted to buy Bitcoin from the first claimant, under the standard model, payment had to be received for the Bitcoin before the Bitcoin were transferred to the buyer. Um, This uh, was not such a case uh, because uh, here uh, the uh, claimant knew the buyer and uh, could consider and did consider entering into an arrangement whereby payment was not actually received by the claimant for the Bitcoin before the Bitcoin was transferred to the buyer. Uh, but because there was an understandable concern and potentially even a lack of absolute trust between the claimant uh, and the buyer in this case, uh, there was a concern that if uh, the claimant transferred the control of the Bitcoin directly to the buyer before any money was paid, the money would not be paid. And there was a concern on the buyer's behalf that if they made the payment under the standard model that's applied to the claimant and waited to receive the Bitcoin, they might not receive the Bitcoin. Um, whether due to a, 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 a lack of good faith or just for some other problem, including, for example, the claimant going into insolvency halfway through the transaction. That created the need for an intermediary, the first defendant, uh, to act uh, as, uh, as we put it, an escrow agent to hold money in its own account, received from the buyer, only to be released on a certain condition, namely the receipt, uh, uh, the, 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 the giving of control over the Bitcoin uh, to the intermediary so that the Bitcoin could be transferred uh, from the intermediary to the buyer uh, without being the, the, the claimant, the seller, being able to prevent that. Um, and it, it's perfectly clear that that arrangement favoured uh, both parties. The judge himself uh, recognised that the arrangement that was entered into uh, uh, was entered into in order to meet the uh, conflicting or competitive uh, demands of uh, each of the respective seller and buyer. And by ceding control over the Bitcoin to the intermediary, the first defendant, on the one hand, and by the buyer handing over the purchase price to the intermediary, the problem could be overcome, but that meant that the intermediary was performing a very significant role uh, in order to facilitate a transaction that otherwise would not happen, 
uh, under which uh, it had uh, control on behalf of uh, the claimant of its 300 Bitcoin. Uh, we can analyze in due course what the actual legal relationship between the claimant and the intermediary is in a situation where control is given up uh, and uh, there is a condition that the Bitcoin will either be passed on to the, to the buyer if the purchase price is received into the bank account controlled by the first defendant intermediary, or if the purchase price is not paid into the bank account controlled by the intermediary, the Bitcoin will be returned. So the intermediary has the Bitcoin, has control over it, uh, exclusive control over it, when it's, uh, to use the colloquial phrase, in the wallet, although not as Justice Black has uh, rightly described, literally in the wallet, and similarly has control over the money belonging to the buyer. And the safe custody of the Bitcoin, through that exclusive control, and indeed of the money on behalf of the, uh, of the seller, is central to the relationship. <clears throat> um, so those were the claimants and the uh, um, <coughs> their, their particular methods of doing business and how they apply to this transaction. Um, as far as the defendants are concerned, Tabarak, the first defendant, it, it, it is and was at the material time a DIFC registered company. Uh, its uh, license uh, is uh, I'm not going to show it to you, but just for your reference, is that 1066. Uh, it's also, and was at the time, a DFSA authorised bank. Uh, and Mr. Ahmadi, central to this case, uh, is one of the listed authorised individuals. Um, if uh, you uh, can look, please, at... Uh, page 1040. I think that we will get um, quicker as we move on. DFSA search firms. Yeah. Uh, you can see that uh, Tabrak Investment Capital is uh, the firm. Uh, if you scroll down uh, to uh, 1041, you can see uh, the services. I think, Mr. Spring, in order to for both parties, okay, when an issue of fact is not in dispute, I think you just mentioned, I don't think uh, uh, okay. it would need to be referred to the relevant. No. Okay. You know, so I, 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 I'll just give you the references and then and, and, yeah, and pass and on. Can, because yeah. it's not a dispute. This, this fact is not a dispute. Yeah. What, 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 I, what I will take you to, if, if, if you go back, please, to um, uh, page um, 1035. This is off the website for Tabarak. Uh, and you can yes. see the reference to <coughs> Dr. Ahmadi uh, there. And uh, then if you scroll down to uh, page uh, 1037, this is of some significance, um, you can see a photograph bottom left of Mr. Turner, the second defendant, and, and just the, the, his details a slip over to the next page, 1038, Director of Investments and European Markets. Uh, and I'll just give you the reference. Um, 
there was, uh, there is also in the bundle at 1251, uh, his curriculum vitae from uh, when he was at his subsequent job to this, in which he described himself as having been head of the first defendant's crypto team. Um, <coughs> that's not a, 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 a description that appears expressly on this uh, website. Um, the point to be made about the, DI, the DFSA authorization for the first defendant and indeed for uh, the uh, Mr. Dr. Ahmadi uh, is, as you are well aware, the DFSA is a globally recognised and respected financial services regulator. Um, procedure to become authorised, um, whether as an entity or as an individual, is not a rubber stamping exercise. Among other things, to become an authorised person or an authorised individual, an applicant must demonstrate that they are fit and proper. Um, for example, they must be able to demonstrate integrity, competence and capability. And moreover, once authorised, there are fundamental principles that apply to the firm or person. Integrity, due skill, care and diligence, suitability of advice, etc. Um, unsurprisingly, we say, the fact that a firm is DFSA authorised gives those considering doing business with that firm a strong degree of assurance as it should. Um, and it's clear from the judge's own findings in relation to, to Ahmadi that neither he uh, nor the second defendant, uh, Mr. Turner, met the standard expected by the market of a DFSA authorised individual or firm. Uh, in terms of the structure of the uh, transaction and the basic facts as to what happened, um, you will have read the judge's judgment in relation to this, and I don't want to take up unnecessary time opening documents to which the judge made frequent reference um, and showing them to the court. Um, uh, the, the key documents are the three structure, deal structure emails uh, what page is it? Thank you. Lost look we want the first de uh, email that's at page 679 sorry I, I have the wrong bit of paper in front of me yeah 679 uh, the second is 906 and the third is 1011. Um, if we can just please look at, uh, as an example, 1011. This is from an email from Mr. Turner, the second defendant, to uh, various uh, uh, individuals, Mr. Saxoner and Mr. Al uh, Al Al Ali of the claimants, <coughs> and uh, also uh, Mr. Morozov, who was one, effectively one of the buyers. Um, and uh, you can see that a uh, procedure is set out which we would be able to satisfy all involved parties. And there's a, there was a dispute before the court as to who proposed these modalities, whether it was the parties and Mr. Turner was simply uh, following instructions or rubber stamping them. Uh, but nonetheless, the basic uh, process is set out there uh, and it's clear that the... Um, uh, this is at a time when as much as um, 500 Bitcoin was being contemplated as being part of the sale. Uh, but 
the reality is that whether or not the proposal for the modalities emanated from Huobi on the seller side or the buyer on the buyer side, uh, what was required of the first defendant acting through the second defendant was clear and was accepted by uh, the first defendant uh, as part of its intermediary role in facilitating this transaction. And, and the um, essential components of our case don't depend upon who, in fact, made the proposals originally because they were signed up to by everybody and it was understood what the essential uh, mechanism should be. Is that right? Because aren't you alleging that uh, Tabarak gave advice as to the form of the deal? We are. So we are. it does matter where the, uh, uh, ad where, where the structure emanated. For the purposes of the contractual claim, doesn't it? Doesn't I accept that? That's 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 my main point. Yes. When we when we come to the tort claim, if there is no binding contract, um, it is our tort claim is put on two bases. One, effectively, assumption of responsibility through undertaking the role of custodian uh, and all that that involved. Two. Uh, assurances that were given uh, and uh, on the day by the second defendant. The judge did not accept the evidence of Huobi's witnesses entirely in relation to those statements or assurances but did go a fair way down the line as you see in his judgment. Um, the, uh, the question of whether there was a uh, specific duty to advise, tortious duty to advise on the modalities either before the meeting but most likely at the meeting isn't crucial to our talk claim. It's complementary to it because uh, if this court accepts that absent an actual binding contract, what the first defendant did was to agree to take control effectively as a custodian of the 300 Bitcoin on behalf of uh, the seller. That uh, required them to do just that and to take reasonable steps to ensure that uh, they did not impair the security, the safety of the Bitcoin through anything that they did through their custodial role, which includes the setting up of the Trezor wallet and then what they did with it physically thereafter. Now, none of that depends on them having a separate duty to advise. Uh, the fact is that they agreed to do something, assumed responsibility for that something, as I've identified, the safe control custody of the Bitcoin, and indeed the money paid, if it had been paid, by the, the seller. Um, and that as such, doesn't depend on a duty to advise. Um, the assurances are an expression, we say, by the second defendant of the assumption of responsibility to take on the custodial role. You can look at them as a separate negligent misstatement, perhaps, in, 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 in one sense, but they are in fact better viewed as part of the uh, performance by the second defendant of the uh, task that and the responsibility that 
he on behalf of the first defendant? So, so cutting through all that, uh, <laughs> the, well, the, uh, yes. the, 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 the tortious duty is really, um, is, is really a sideshow. Your real case is that they were a gratuitous bailey, essentially of the means of accessing the, uh, and controlling the Bitcoin uh, and all the duties that flow from that uh, gratuitous bailment. It, absent a, a uh, absent a, a, a concluded contract. Well, you can put it in terms of bailment. I mean, it, that was that was a particular ground. Yes, but I mean, uh, you know, if, yeah. if if we don't like the word custodianship, yes. um, uh, I mean, you were undoubtedly uh, sorry. Tabrak was undoubtedly a bailey of the physical trezor wallet. Went into its safe. Yeah. Uh, absent a. a uh, uh, absent a, 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 a contract, the issue then becomes, doesn't it, whether its bailment of the means of control of the Bitcoin goes further and actually becomes custodianship of the Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. And, and, and our tort claim, as, 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 whether you call it a bailment claim or a tort claim, is, is essentially an assumption of responsibility claim arising out of the role that Tabarak performed. And um, the, the duty to advise uh, is, is something of a... Sideshow. Sideshow. <laughs> yes. yes. In, indeed. The assurances are they're not a sideshow because they're part, of, part and parcel of all of that. And they're, and they're significant, and they go to um, the reasonableness of the reliance of uh, uh, Huobi on the assumption of responsibility by Tabarak. They go to that. And the judge, the judge found expressly that it wasn't reasonable for Huobi to rely on uh, Tabarak. And so to rely on Tabarak to do what? To um, well, let me let me let me show you the precise passage because it's quite telling. Um, if you just give me one moment. If you just give me the paragraph number in the judgment as well, because I have the judgment separately. <coughs> it, 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 it's coming up. The main passages are 110 to 11, but may I just take you back to um, uh, a build-up to that so you can see it. 106, each, each. Uh, 9485. 9485. And uh, in 106... The judge starts off by talking about Mr. Turner not being the originator of the proposed modalities, uh, and we say that's not relevant um, for the reasons that I've already uh, uh, been through. And over the top of the next page, he says, um, uh, in the third line, what Huobi was primarily interested in was whether Tabarak, um, a DIFC company and small merchant bank, would act as a middleman and provide an account in Dubai to which and from which the purchase monies resulting from OTC, BTC transactions could be transferred. Now, that, that is um, one uh, aspect of their concern, but with respect to the judge, he's completely wrong uh, not to uh, put on at least an equal footing uh, Huobi's interest in uh, Tabarak uh, taking control of the Bitcoin uh, 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 to perform the intermediary role that I have described and take control and safe control. Um, uh, uh, and then at um, paragraph uh, 110, which is 9487, on the facts that I found I hold the relationship between Tabarak and Turner was not sufficiently proximate for the alleged duty of care, 
uh, and then third sentence. Um, I say this because I find that Tabra, acting by Mr. Turner, did not assume responsibility, quo ad quobi, for these statements, and it was not reasonable for Wobi to trust Tabra, Turner, to exercise such a degree of care as the circumstances required. Uh, this, that's the key phrase, uh, Justice Black. It was not reasonable for Huobi to trust Tabarak Turner to exercise such a degree of care as the circumstances required. Uh, now, we, 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 we find that a troubling sentence. But this is all in the context of, of um, a tortious um, liability for statements giving rise to economic loss, isn't it? Yes. Well, we're, not, well, 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 we're he, not talking about that at the moment. He, 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 well, Lord, I'm, not, uh, just, just about, I'm not sure it's quite right. It's okay. in Paragraph 110, he's dealing with both. So the first sentence, he's dealing with the submission generally about the relationship. Okay. And then he separately moves on to the assurance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry about interrupting. Not at all. Um, but but uh, that, that's... Uh, uh, that, that's the point I was making about the judge's express finding that it wasn't reasonable for Huobi to trust. It's a, 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 an interesting word. Um, uh, as is uh, the, the, the phrase, to exercise such a degree of care as the circumstances required. Uh, does that mean that uh, the circumstances, i.e. the... Um, uh, setting up of a Trezor wallet through which control of the Bitcoin would, uh, as had been agreed, become uh, that of the uh, uh, first defendant, uh, is the judge saying that, that those circumstances required a particular degree of care uh, in order to ensure that there was a safe place uh, for control uh, to be situated, if I can put it that way, uh, but that it wasn't reasonable to expect Tabarak Turner to exercise that degree of care, um, in which case, what degree of care was it reasonable to expect them to exercise? If none, why not? If some, why not the requisite degree of care that the circumstances required. That's a, a, a puzzling uh, feature of this part of the judgment where the judge does not undertake the necessary analysis to enable us to fully understand his reasoning or what indeed he's even finding right there. Now, I'll come back to that in due course, but I wanted to just show you where in the judgment uh, it, it was um, uh, expressed, uh, the, the finding that there was not an a, 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 a reasonable reliance on the assumption of responsibility is to be located. Um, uh, and you'll see also in paragraph 111 at the bottom of the page while we're there, that that's the paragraph where the judge goes as far as to say that um, Mr. Al-Ali um, feared that there was a risk in the procedure that was being adopted, namely uh, the um, uh, passing of the wallet to the buyers to enable them to read, uh, in inverted commas, their six words of the seed code, uh, and the conclusion that he unwisely chose to agree to the proposed use of the wallet uh, in those circumstances. I'll come back to that in due course, but... Uh, we say that's a finding uh, that is uh, a finding that is contrary to other findings that the judge made and it is to the extent that it's material to the outcome of the case uh, one that the court will need to consider. <coughs> so uh, uh, I showed you one of the emails. I've given you the references for the others. Uh, the uh, account opening agreement that the judge held was the foundation and the background for the contractual agreement that he held the parties did enter into, albeit that it did not become binding. 
uh, because uh, the uh, condition as to the payment of the account opening fee was not met. That's at uh, page 1190. I have it at 951. There, there are various places. No, I think the reason that I bookmark that one is because that's the signed one. Yes, there are two signed versions, are there? but the okay. subsequent one was put in the correct chronological order. Oh, right, okay. I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, give me, the, give me, give me the, uh, the reference again to the one that you're going to refer to. 1190. Thank you. Can I, just so you have a complete list, it's important to note that this, this version is the signed version. So... Yes, so, uh, is, so is 951. Uh, yes. Uh, but the version signed by the second defendant, Mr. Turner, that was sent to uh, Huobi on the 17th of December, for your reference, is at 684. It's in exactly the same form. It's signed by him, and it's sent to Huobi uh, on the 17th of December. Uh, then you have the... Can, can we agree to refer to one particular, since they're identical? Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting the chronology. One, page 684? 1190 is 1, the document I would invite you to okay. take as your point of reference. 1, 1, okay, we, let's use that particular. And we've got um, various relevant uh, clauses. I'm not going to take you through all of them, um, but please look at the uh, clause at 1191, fees, uh, non-refundable processing fee. That's what I think became called the account opening fee, uh, $25,000. Uh, and... Uh, further down, you will see that uh, the uh, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph: the client shall pay fees for any services TICL acts on behalf of the client. This fee would be different and would be determined based on each separate business activity. So, in this case, as as you know from the judgment, it was agreed that in addition to the account opening fee, the uh, defendant would receive commission on the uh, transaction uh, and the final percentage of that transaction was actually agreed in, in, in the room on the day on the 3rd of February. Um, uh, then, apart from that, you'll see uh, a, a, a binding agreement, an entire agreement clause uh, at clause 6 on page 1193. Once this agreement has been signed, should either TICL or the client want to make any amendment to the agreement, both TICL and the client have to agree to the given amendment in a separate addendum to be attached to this agreement. Um, uh, judge uh, when he concluded that a, 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 an oral contract had been entered into between the parties uh, was satisfied that that condition had in effect been waived, uh, as he was satisfied that the due diligence requirements, which were also a precondition, uh, had been complied, uh, had the, the, the requirement to... to um, uh, 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 meet those requirements have been met uh, or waived. In fact, it stopped, to use his words. Uh, the one aspect of the agreement that he held was not um, uh, the subject of a waiver or estoppel, uh, was the payment in advance of the account opening fee. Uh, you'll see, finally, at uh, 1194, that this... Uh, agreement makes express provision for waiver uh, 
clearly waiver in general is uh, uh, open in relation to this agreement. Um, this clause makes specific provision about um, when uh, certain uh, conduct or lack of conduct by one of the parties uh, means that um, uh, there will be no waiver. But it's perfectly clear the judge proceeded on the basis that uh, terms could be waived or there could be an estoppel. He found that that in, is in fact what happened in relation to the due diligence, as I've said. <coughs> uh, and there, there, there was no dispute below about the um, availability of waiver as, as a, 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 a route to uh, the result for which the, um, uh, legally, uh, as a route to the result for which the claimants were contending. Uh, the judge, however, held that um, uh, in relation to the account opening fee precondition, the requirements hadn't actually been met for a waiver. Um, and then you can see an entire agreement clause at, at, at the bottom just above the in witness whereof. Um, I'd like to just show you uh, the, the, uh, one of the other deal structure emails, please. This is at page 679. Uh, this, this is, uh, again, setting out uh, a, a procedure or a process uh, that in headline terms is the procedure or process that was in the event followed um, and I say that just so you are aware of why I say it uh, we don't accept that the judge's ca characterization of the buyer presenting uh, new treasure wallets that they had brought to the meeting and asking and saying that the, one of those treasure wallets should be used rather than one that was provided by the first defendant, we don't accept that that was a game changer. The process that was contemplated involved using a wallet. Um, uh, in, in some of the emails and, and structure emails, it's referred to explicitly as a Trezor wallet. In others, it's just a wallet. Um, uh, but the question it, is who controls it? I mean, if you're, using, it. if you're using Morozov's um, uh, well, I can well understand that that's a game changer um, because then they have control over the wallet uh, and uh, <laughs> they could just waltz off with the Bitcoin. Yeah, but, they, but my point is that that's not what, that's not what happened. No, no, but I'm, what I'm saying is yeah. the, the proposed, well, what happened at the meeting was that first of all Morozov okay. said, let's, let's use our wallet. Uh, and then there was a discussion which we'll come yeah. to, I'm sure, yeah. when, we, when, when we look at the facts. But to say that wasn't a game changer when you're talking about originally having uh, a pre-existing Tabarak uh, Trezor wallet over which Tabarak had complete control, I mean, you can't say that wasn't a game changer. No, but the, 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 the use that was actually made of the wallet oh, the fact that you were using wasn't it, a game changer. No, it wasn't a game changer that using a Trezor wallet, but that, that just begs the question. The reality is about control. Uh, agree. Yes. I agree. I agree. As you're aware, it was a brand new wallet on the findings of fact. But you know, well, it looked it was apparently apparently anyway. brand new. Wallet. All right, um, but uh, I, 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 you have my point, and, and I'm agreeing with you. It's about who controls the wallet that's important. So when in this email it says, for example, in um, uh, the Second set of bullet points are halfway <coughs> down. Partners will sign an SPA agreement, then work the real <coughs> is going to start. 
partners agree to run transactions based on price building platform. First bullet point. Um, partner one gives order to inform <coughs> partner two about amount X, Y of money on account at their Tabarac account. Um, so that's the Tabarac client account. It's a client, it's an account over which they have control. Part, uh, uh, partner two sends the Bitcoin to the Tabarac wallet, uh, and the reference to a Tabarac wallet is obviously a, a wallet that it controls. Um, it doesn't have to be one that it took into the room. Uh, if the one that they end up using is one over which they have proper control. Um, and and uh, at the bottom, you'll see that the, 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 the uh, wording that Mr. Turner uses, this way the deal could work and both parties are satisfied and no harm will of parties will take place. Not very clearly expressed in terms of the... Well, English is not his first language. English is not his first language. No, it's not a criticism, but just, it's perfectly clear that what he's saying is that both parties will be satisfied. We, we are effectively acting uh, to assist both parties, and no harm will take place, i.e., you won't lose your Bitcoin and you won't lose your money. Mm. That's the important <coughs> point. Um, so that, this is that, 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 that's uh, some of the relevant documentation prior to the meeting of the 3rd of February. Um, it, it, there's then um, uh, yeah, there is then um, uh, the WhatsApp that I want to show you uh, or an email at 1086. This is an email from Mr. Saxoner to uh, Mr. Turner, sent uh, during the meeting at lunchtime, 3rd of February, 1335. This is after they've agreed on what the relevant... Uh, exchange rate and price will be for the Bitcoin that is to be sold uh, and therefore they are able to work out having agreed what the percentage of the commission that is to go to Tabarac should be i.e. 0.25% uh, how the money will end up being um, divided and if you go to 1087 you can see uh, the proceeds, uh, the, the, the value of the first 13 coins is about 2.9 million US dollars. Um, what's called revenue, which is effectively commission, payable to Huobi and Tabarak, uh, is divided as it's $88,000 between the two of them, divided as to 81 odd to Huobi and 7.2 to Tabarat, 2.8%, 0.25%. Don't forget that in addition, uh, Tabarat was to receive uh, the account opening fee, which is also set out here uh, at 26,250. Uh, so uh, the total amount to uh, the first defendant for this transaction is uh, approximately £34,000. Dollars. Dollars. I'm so sorry, my lord. Uh, <coughs> which is about 11 to 12% of the total revenue from the sale of the Bitcoin. Um, it's a significant proportion. Uh, it's an even more significant proportion of what Huobi's share was. It's about 38% of Huobi's share. Um, so that's um, confirmation that uh, after the pre-meeting discussion between Mr. Uh, al Ali and Mr. Ahmadi about whether or not the account opening fee would have to be paid in advance of the uh, 
claimants becoming the client of Tabarak and Tabarak being involved in the uh, transaction where the judge found that Mr. Al-Ali told Mr. Ahmadi that it would be paid out of the proceeds of the transaction. His finding was that Mr. Ahmadi did not expressly accept that. He was silent. Uh, the meeting then went ahead. Uh, Mr. Turner acting on behalf of the first defendant. There was a... Uh, uh, the the, 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 the uh, wallet was set up. I'm, I'm just breaking this down into headlines. Um, the amounts that were to be transferred were agreed as per this email. The commission was agreed at 0.25% for Tabarak. This email was sent confirming all of these figures and the transaction then went ahead uh, up to the point of lunchtime uh, when the Bitcoin had been transferred and uh, control of the Bitcoin had been transferred to the first defendant through the Trezor wallet, which had been locked in Mr. Ahmadi's safe. He had the combination. He accepted it and put it there for safekeeping. So we have, um, we say, looked at in that way, at that level, a clear series of events in which Tabarak, through Mr. Turner, is uh, uh, acting uh, as an intermediary with an acceptance through that conduct, including agreeing the commission to be paid to Tabarak that Huobi was a client. Uh, and we say that that, uh, that series of events, that conduct, uh, Mr. Ahmadi not challenging or disagreeing with the assertion that the fee would be paid out of the transaction proceeds rather than in advance, and then all of the events that I've described happening, that conduct uh, clearly gives rise to a waiver by estoppel uh, of the uh, precondition in the contract that the account opening fee should be paid in advance. And we challenge the judge's finding that that did not, as a matter of law, mixed with fact, uh, amount to a waiver by estoppel. I always thought it should be the other way around, really, an estoppel by waiver. Yes. There you go. I rather agree. <laughs> um, it's just the way that it tends to be. Yes. Yeah. Uh, may I say, and there is there are authorities in the bundle and textbook references in relation to the legal concept that applies in this situation, um, it, it, it can be looked at as waiver. It can be looked at as an estoppel by convention. It can be looked at as an estoppel by representation. Well, the judge asked himself both questions in the judgment. He asked himself both estoppel and waiver in, in, in the judgment. He didn't... He didn't um, Join the two in a waiver by estoppel or estoppel by waiver. No, but he applied a single test. He applied a single test to, yes. to the outcome, and um, in substance, we don't quarrel with the test. And although I I, I I I can show you some of the cases that enable one to look at this through the lens of estoppel by convention, for example, um, the reason that that's a, a, a relevant way of looking at it is that one might well see that this was a, a convention with crossings of the line and we have very helpful recent Supreme Court uh, authority on that. That would be a new argument in this case. Mm. Well, uh, I think that it's another way of putting the judge's approach, but if, 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 if that's the view that the court's going to take, I'm not going to 
didn't take too long over it. But it, it, it well, then, with the, the, the expression it, stopped by convention doesn't appear anywhere in the 16,000 pages that we have in front of us. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on that. Yeah. Come, come, okay. back, come back to the, the, the best way of dealing with that point. Helpful to have the indication. Excuse me. Yes, we, I, I am reminded that we did look at it from the perspective of Article 31 of the contract law um, uh, in our uh, closing submissions below, and the judge uh, did not, in his judgment, uh, uh, look at it in that way. He applied uh, the test uh, that we have been discussing. Uh, I mean, there is a, yes, I mean, there is an argument. I, I, I'm aware that there, there is an argument uh, about the test that was applied, but, but I, I hadn't understood a stop by convention <laughs> figured in that argument. No, no, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I'm yeah, just okay. making the point that, that there is a... <coughs> the, 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 the way that the judge actually analysed it in his judgment is not the only way in which oh, no, I see. I've, it, it was I, I, I addressed see in, 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 in closing submissions. Yeah. But I accept that estoppel by convention was not separately addressed no. in the closing submissions before the no. judge. No, but I, I, I have registered that there is, there, there, is, there is a difference between you, uh, as it were, on um, the, uh, the, the appropriate test there. And the, the judge, you say the judge adopted the wrong test. I, I, know, I understand that. <coughs> Sorry, I misunderstood. I thought, he, I thought Leonard Henry was not quarrelling with the judge's well, test. I thought he, he, said, he said he didn't quarrel with mm. the judge's test, and he was satisfied the judge had quite the right test. So the, uh, yeah, the written submissions... Uh, I, I just heard my learned friend say that. Uh, yeah. he, 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 he should have looked at it through the lens of Article 31. Yes, I, I've seen um, that in the written submissions. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think Mr. Hill is right. I mean, you, I mean, you have to jump one way or the other. Uh, and uh, are you saying that his finding, that the test that he applied is the wrong test? Or are you saying it's one of the tests he could have applied? I'm saying the latter. Okay. I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, in terms of what happened uh, in the room, uh, I, I, I want to show you um, uh, two documents so that you have them uh, in your uh, vision. Uh, the first is Mr. Turner's memory minutes at 1110. These were, uh, this was a document submitted by uh, Mr. Uh, Turner uh, in relation to the uh, police investigation into the theft of the claimant's Bitcoin. Um, uh, shortly after the events, um, the It's an important document because it's contemporaneous or reasonably contemporaneous. Um, the fact that it's made for the purpose of a police investigation and, and to some extent, like everyone else who participated in this, Mr. Turner was no doubt under some degree of suspicion as to what had happened. Uh, one has to at least bear in mind that it could potentially be somewhat self-surfing. But it is a uh, detailed account of what happened uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, in, in that sense um, is important and helpful in terms of identifying um, the facts in relation to the meeting. Uh, I'm not going to take you through it in detail now, um, but I wanted you to be aware of it. Uh, you can see uh, 
that um, uh, it starts under the heading 10.30 a.m. Uh, with description of Huobi, and he says Huobi is a client of Tabarak. Then under 10.50, Narvacon, who's, which is the actual bar, is a client of Tabarak. Um, uh, and then he goes into a description of what uh, happens. Uh, the setup procedure, which is much discussed in the judgment, is dealt with in some detail on page uh, from the bottom of page one uh, one o to the top of page one um, uh, one uh, one. That's There's one the issue of fact uh, since we're <coughs> since we're looking at the granularity of of, of what occurred. Uh, on, on sort of every there's one issue fact that the, the judge found that Mr. Thurner um, put a pin code on on the wallet. Yes. Uh, I, I've I, been trying I to track. To, I wanted to flag up for you that that's not here. Well, uh, yes, I, I, well, I noticed it's not that's here. One of the things I wanted to make it clear okay. it, in, in my notes on the side, yeah. this om omits reference um, to the pin code. Um, but but he said that Mr. Mr. He, he uh, forgive me, is it Turner or Thurner? I, I Turner. Turner. Yeah, Turner. Turner. Mr. Turner. So so Turner. so uh, Mr. Turner. But he said Mr. Turner admitted that. So is, is, do I find that in the you oral? You find evidence? it in the oral evidence in, in, in the transcript. I can give you the reference. Yes, give please you just do. Just one moment. Yeah. Uh, I've got it marked up, but I don't have it written on a separate piece of paper in front of me. Um, it is at. It's going to take a long time to find it. You can come back and give me the reference. It is at 8650. Thank you very much. It was put to him that he set up the PIN code and he agreed. Thank you. <coughs> um, and uh, we rely on that as a, an important piece of evidence. It, 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 the judge found it and, and it's, in, it's in his judgment. He didn't focus on it when he came to look at the significance of all of the facts and evidence to the role that was played by uh, D1. It, it's one of the uh, important factors that points to the custodial role that uh, was assumed by the first defendant. It gives the first defendant unique, exclusive access to the wallet itself, which means that if control of the Bitcoin is to be uh, accessed or given to anybody else from the wallet, uh, it can only be done using that PIN. And but the parties were working on the assumption that the only way of controlling the Bitcoin was through the Trezor wallet. Um, the, uh, the mnemonic is a disaster recovery, Indeed. Uh, a disaster recovery procedure. Um, but as I understand it, the, uh, the parties uh, assume that the, uh, the, 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 the Trezor wallet would be under the control of, yes. of Tabarak, and, and Mr. Turner, having put the, the pin in, yes. was, as it were, an additional safeguard yes. to it having been physically in, yeah. in the safe. They well. had physical control of the wallet, and they had, um, through the pin code, electronic identity yes. access to actually op use it to deal with the Bitcoin. Yes, and nobody knew you could circumvent all of that by having all 12 uh, words of the mnemonic. Well, well, the uh, Russians did, but nobody else. Well, I think, I think that's going a little far, because if, if, if uh, Mr. Turner... Uh, Maybe I'm being... Yes, I'm being unfair. Nobody knew that the, the process that was adopted gave the Russians the opportunity of having all 12 no. Certainly. Which would enable them to circumvent both the PIN code and the physical position certainly, of the Trezor. Certainly, uh, we didn't know. The claimants certainly didn't know. They never held the wallet. They, they, they had no role in, the, in, in, in setting it up. They did not... Well, know. the judges found the judges found that Mr. Turner um, didn't know, uh, that, uh, and Tabak, Tabarak didn't know, uh, and you've not challenged that finding. No, that's correct. 
That's correct. Um, my, the point that I came back to you on, which I think you were accepting, is that um, the parties, uh, uh, certainly Mr. Turner uh, uh, and the buyers, well, certainly Mr. Turner, in um, uh, attempting to divide up the 12 words, yeah. six for me on behalf of uh, Huobi and six for the buyer. Um, Was it attempting to forestall the possibility of circumventing yes, exactly. physical possession. So the, the possibility the that it could happen yes. was, was, was apparent okay. certainly to him. As I understand from the facts of the case, both parties could see the 12 mnemonics. Is that how it was? No. Both the parties, the buyer and the seller, could see all the 12. No. no. That's why he, they wrote 12, he wrote 6, he hand over, and there was a question... The, not quite, no. Oh, first, they can't. first of all, please note that the buyer mm -hmm. never saw anything. So Huo the Huobi people in the room never were never given the wallet and never looked at the words themselves. They, the, the, the uh, Mr. Turner was the person who plugged right. the wallet in you, into the laptop and uh, initiated the process of generating the 12 words. Yes. Which appear on the screen, yes. uh, not as a collective of twelve words that you can look at all in one go, uh -huh. but uh, either either one by one or in small groups, so that you can scroll down to write down the first six, uh -huh. which is what he he did. He then handed the wallet to the buyer, who was supposed to scroll down and and write down the second six. Yes. Without looking at the first six, because the first six were effectively for to give control to Mr. Turner. But he could he could have seen the buyer. The other party could have seen the both parties could have seen the twelve. If they, it would appear, and that's what the judge found was the most. If you if you if you if you are handed the wallet during the setup phase, during the verification of the twelve word disaster recovery, if you have it at that point, uh, it would appear that you can scroll down on the screen in order to see all 12 words. Okay. And in order to prevent the uh, 12 words being um, seen by the buyer when handed the wallet, um, the 12 word seed code would have needed to have been verified already and, and, and sealed, so to speak, set for the wallet. Um, what Mr. Turner could have done is to write down on a piece of paper the second six and handed it to uh, the buyer, and that way they would only have had the second six. But in fact, by handing the wallet halfway through the process of verifying the mnemonic, the 12, 12 words, the, the, the uh, they were able to scroll down. Actually, right. he handed the tablet, the, the laptop, rather than the wallet, because the wallet was... I'm sorry to write, but the reference now twice given the impression that it was Mr. Turner's idea to, that the Russians would note down the six words. Mm. The judge has made a clear finding on that, that that was the, that was the buyer's idea. That's a paragraph 24, and Huobi agreed to that. So it's nothing to do with Mr. Turner. Yeah. Well, uh, the buyer, what, what was clear was that the buyer never itself had the wallet in its possession, never saw the screen, never saw the scrolling mechanism, was completely unaware of the fact that you could... Um, scroll all the way through and see all 12 because clearly they wouldn't have agreed to the process and nor, to be fair to Mr Turner, would Mr Turner. The judge held that Mr Turner, who, who, who actually held it in his hands and did the scrolling, didn't realise. What page would that be, the judgment? I want to go through, I want to go through it again. 9443. 9443. 9443. Of judgment. Okay. <coughs> uh, 
for uh, so, so for just 24, did you see? Yeah. Yes, it's the it, okay. pastor I was referring to says, I find that Mr. Morozov uh, said he wanted to set up the wallet and explain the coins going transfer the wallet if a transfer knew all 12 words. And so the thing to do was for the first six words of a C phrase to be noted by Tabarak and the remaining six words to be noted by those representing the buyer. Yes. So it's an initiative that came from the Russian side, and that's what Huobi then agreed to. Okay. And I'm sorry for writing. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I, 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 my point was that the seller, Huobi, um, did not play any part yes, no, beyond, no. beyond agreeing yes, that's to the procedure, did not play any physical role in, in the setting up of the, of the, of the wallet. That's agreed did not have the opportunity to see on the screen what the scrolling involved, did not know <coughs> that you could, uh, um, by scrolling down, see all 12 words. <coughs> and apparently, uh, uh, as far as the judge is concerned, nor did Mr. Turner, or, or, albeit that he uh, uh, was himself scrolling in order to write down uh, the first six words of the mnemonic. Where would be this be reflected in the minutes? Uh, sorry, in the rec uh, trial, in the notes of evidence. This would you remember where these uh, these facts appear in the well, notes of evidence? But first of all, first of all, you've got you've got the memory minute that I uh, took memory you minutes. To. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you obviously have. Um, a lot of witness statements, and we can give you some references uh, in due course for where in the witness statements mm, the witness meeting statement. is described. It's also dealt with at some length in the cross-examination. Um, I, I would, I would flag up for you specifically. Yes, yes. Um, I just, I just want to know for whether the cross-examination of Mr. Turner is a very useful read, if I can put it that way, in terms of his account under cross-examination of what happened on the 3rd of February. That starts at page 8635. <clears throat> and it goes through to 86... Um, five nine, pretty much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, that's where you will find uh, that, and that includes the reference that I gave Justice Black earlier to the pin, yeah. the pin code being being okay. set Thank up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, none of Junior would like to address you on, if with permission of the court, on, yes. uh, to clarify something that I just said. Yes. Yes. Clarify some of the technicalities. Um, so, Mr. Turner was asked the expert evidence established, and I can take um, your lordships to the relevant um, uh, evidence, that on this, on this Trezor device, at the point of setting up the mnemonic, three or four words would appear on the screen at a particular time. And so what happens is, then, one scrolls down, and one can scroll back up again. Mm -hmm. Now, in the memory minutes, Mr. Turner, and these memory minutes were provided on the 12th of February, so very soon after mm. the theft. He says that um, the seventh word was um, already there and, and, and was ready to be seen by the buyer. Okay. So it was suggested at trial that there's a clicking sound when you scroll up and down, but um, the experts conceded that that wasn't the case. Second point, um, so you have the scrolling mechanism. The other point is that at the end, write down the 12 words and then you go through a verification procedure. That's a mandatory step. If any of the words are, are wrong or inputted incorrectly at that stage, all of the 12 words then appear 
Okay, I, I miss you. What, what we're supposed to do again? What were they supposed to do again? The last, the second so part. So there is a mandatory step yes. in setting up yes. the treasure. Yes. And that involves um, verifying, verifying yes. 12 um, recovery words. Okay. I'm show proceed. The, I'm going to show the expert evidence on that in a moment. So after doing um, the, the 6 and the 6, you verify again. Yeah, so when you Ooh. do the 12, Ooh. if it was just one person, you do the 12. Uh, the machine. And then the, the machine, machine itself. says you have to verify it. Okay. By, putting three word, by putting three words in. By putting, oh, exactly. And if you get any of those wrong, it shows you all 12 again. Exactly. So, I all, see. All, so either the buyer could have scrolled up or down, mm -hmm. or the buyer could, could have, have just put any number. Exactly. And then the whole number comes out again. Correct. Exactly. That is the weakness of the system. Well, it's not a weakness <laughs> system because you're never meant to share the thing. The whole point is, yeah. what they did was a complete abuse of the way you're meant to use a, a Trezor wallet. You're meant to keep a Trezor wallet to yourself as a matter of privacy. So this, mm. is, this is just disaster recovery uh, procedure uh, for, for yourself. You're not meant to be doing it with, a, with another person. But the point being that in the evidence, in, in, in part of the judgment, um, um, so so I was wrong. I was wrong when I said earlier on that factually there's no dispute. That in fact there are already disputes around. No, I don't, I, I don't think there is a dispute in mm. terms of the technicalities, mm. as as I understand. But there are basically two potential methods that were. Well, these, these, these facts are very relevant to show whether there was negligence, whether there was a breach of contract, and things like that. So that's why I need to, to understand. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I think, I think what would be helpful for both my colleagues, um, uh, and I confess I, I know it uh, uh, and have seen it, is if you perhaps pulled off the internet a picture of what a Trezor wallet looks like. I was thinking exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> whether you show a video or what it is all about. <laughs> YouTube very helpful, but there is actually a photo in the bundle that they were supplementary photos um, which the judge wasn't interested to see. So just to say that that wasn't, um, I don't think that was formally okay. admitted. Uh, and I assume this level. is the practice for purchase of uh, bitcoins, or is no, no, this is not the practice. Oh, okay. Certainly not for. Well, of course, I mean the the buyer is not familiar with it, and and he was relying on the as you have just showed just now, he was relying on this uh, the defendant to help him. What all. I would say is that there are various. That's the issue, really. There are all kinds of ways in which control can be taken by, mm. or we would say, a custodian through escrow. However, you can have some kind of online um, access, or you could have. Um, you could use a cold wallet. The issue here was the recovery seat. That's what went wrong. I own I own bitcoins, set. but all managed by my agent. <laughs> all he does is you're worth so much today, you're worth so much tomorrow. That's all I know. <laughs> Otherwise, I know nothing about that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Spring, can you thank please you. continue? Um, uh, uh, and uh, the the evidence at trial was that the. Um, uh, the Huobi representatives in relation to the first six seed words, which of course they never saw, uh, that's because they, as the judge found, uh, uh, asked <coughs> Mr. Turner to set up the wallet. They didn't want the buyer to set it up. Um, and uh, equally, they uh, wanted, uh, agreed to Mr. Turner holding the first six seed words, which um, under the buyer's proposal, the, the, the seller would have six words and the buyer would have six words from the, 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 the mnemonic. Um, and, and, and that's the, co the confidential information that forms the subject matter of our first ground of appeal, which I'll come to in a moment, the, 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 the breach of confidence. Um, Mr. Turner, uh, with the agreement of uh, the claimant's representatives in the room, uh, held the uh, so that he had control uh, uh, of the uh, uh, first six words. Um, 
effectively on behalf of the claimant. Uh, and that is the uh, confidential information that um, was then disclosed uh, to the buyer by the handing of the Trezor wallet over to the buyer to enable them either to scroll uh, back up and read the six words that were meant to be exclusively known to uh, Mr. Turner, uh, effectively on behalf of uh, 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 Huobi. Um, and, um, uh, are, you now, are you now opening ground one? No, I'm just explaining okay. the relevance <laughs> right. of that fact okay. that I told you, and I'll, and I'll come to ground one okay. in very shortly, because I want to get, get into the ground and not yes. get further diverted. But that, I just want to make it clear that that's the factual strata, substratum for, for, for ground one. Well, I understand that at 4546, uh, there is a photograph of a Trezor, of a Trezor wallet. Um, this is in the bundle, but it wasn't formally admitted in evidence. Uh, and it may be that in order for you to rely on it as a photograph of the relevant uh, yeah, I thought they wallet. had. I thought they had two buttons on the front to now allow you to scroll down. This one doesn't seem to. No, it's a touch screen. It's a touch okay. screen. So it's not, so in other words, it's, it's, is it, we don't know whether this was a, the type that was used or not. Well, we need to get, we need to, uh, before you can say that that photograph and rely on that photograph being it, we, I believe that we put that forward as a photograph of the relevant. Well, device. look, it would be helpful if the parties could agree, agree which so model. I'm inviting the other side to agree that at some point. If they, the if they, if they can, if and they if can. they have recollections, but uh, it certainly, I think, would help me to know which model of, of, of the Trezor it was, and whether it was a touchscreen or, or whether you had the one with the buttons on the front. Can can you let's assume this is similar, or at least not the one similar to the one that was used. Nine modify, ten miss, eleven crew, twelve inch. Or oh, the, the mnemonics then is M M no, M M C I. It's the full word. Oh. So your twelve your your mnemonic is a the words. of twelve words. Oh words because I learn mnemonics as the abbreviation. Yeah. That is what I learned to be mnemonics. I never knew. Yeah, okay. So you need the full word. Ah, okay. The full 12 words, mm. you see. And you can see um, four words out of the 12 numbered there. Um, uh, just, uh, <coughs> if I may, please, yes. uh, the, uh, in terms of the documents that I want to just flag up at this stage, can I take you now, please, to um, 1118? This is an email from Mr. Turner sent on the 16th of February, so just under two weeks from the relevant day of the event, to Mr. Morozov, um, complaining about the uh, way in which they had behaved uh, as, as buyers. Um, we are wondering and being disappointed about your silence and your non-cooperation. This is really not understandable, but shows your involvement in this criminal activity. We inform that still no money from Navicon transfer in Europe or from an announced UAE accounts. And just to explain what that means, it, those were the accounts that uh, were revealed by the buyer in advance of the transaction to Mr. Turner on behalf of D1 to uh, provide him with uh, sufficient proof that they had accounts uh, in, in, from which they would be able to transfer the money um, to make the purchase. And that, that, that uh, proof of uh, ability to make a bank transfer was part of the service that the first defendant was providing uh, to the parties as an intermediary, as well as obviously then providing an actual account itself for the money to be paid into. But this is about the source of funding. Um, uh, 
This is showing us that you never had in mind to execute seriously the deal you brought into our office. You and your Russian companions just misused our bank to convince Huobi to enter into the deal with Navicon. Um, but you and your friends never had in mind to execute seriously this deal. Now, in the midst of making a strong and quite emotional complaint to Mr. Moritzoff, there's a very important phrase to convince Huobi. And that is a, a, an accurate contemporaneous description of what the bank Tabarak did uh, both before the transaction in terms of reassuring the, uh, reassuring the uh, Huobi, the, the seller, uh, that the buyer had the ability to transfer funds from accounts to the client account. Uh, and that they had a uh, mechanism agreed between the three of them, whoever actually originally proposed it, that would um, uh, enable um, uh, uh, the, 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 the transaction to proceed in the safe way that both parties wanted. And we say uh, to convince Huobi to enter the deal in the room, because as we know, in the room, there were some reservations on the claimant side and they were clearly reassured. Whether they were reasonable to be reassured is another matter. Um, that's the judge's finding is that they weren't, but nonetheless they were reassured because as a matter of fact they agreed to the Bitcoin being transferred. Uh, and we say that is uh, an important contemporaneous indicator of how Mr. Turner perceived the bank's role in relation to Huobi in this transaction. <coughs> Um, uh, uh, and then I uh, will invite you to look at uh, uh, one part of the cross-examination of Mr. Turner. It's at uh, 8651. Um, starting at line 8, you asked him to lock it in the safe and he did so. Answer, correct. Yes, correct. And the reason you did that was, the reason you set the pin code, um, he, he, it's the, I think it's the page before where he admits that he's, he set the pin code. Um, I gave you that reference. Yes. Earlier, but reading on. Yeah. Um, it's because it was Tabarak who was safe keeping the Bitcoin before payment was made. It, and he answers, it was as it was agreed between the parties. We should keep this for two or three hours when, until the money or Navicon should hit the account, Tabarak, the device, yes. And on your understanding, at that stage, the only person who would have had access to the Bitcoin in the wallet was Tabarak, correct? At that stage, my understanding was that nobody can do anything without the device and without the PIN code. That's correct, yes. And it would have been the case that had payment not been made, uh, which as uh, it wasn't as we know, this is now over the top of the next page, by the buyer, that the Bitcoin should simply have been transferred back to Huobi. Answer, this should happen if no main payment will come in, yes. And that's, we say, Mr. Turner accepting uh, 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 that uh, the, the, the role of uh, D1 was to hold the Bitcoin for a period of time prior to the purchase price arriving and then transfer control of the Bitcoin to the buyer. But if the money didn't arise, its uh, role was to simply transfer it back to Huobi. And that, we say, is a custodial role um, subject to preconditions as to what to do with the Bitcoin in different situations. Um, uh, then please, and this is, uh, these are factual points that are relevant to ground one, which we're <coughs> going to come to uh, uh, in due course, uh, but I'll show you them now, please, in the cross-examination at 8645. Uh, lines 21 to 22. 
uh, starting at 18, question. Well, um, you initiated the wallet to generate 12 words. Um, may I, actually, may I just go back to line 9? Because it just shows what he said about the discussions in relation to the splitting of the, of, of the mnemon, mnemonic. At, at, at line 9, there was before then discussions about the setup procedure between the parties because as a Trezor device, when to set up newly, you need to have so-called seed words. And these two parties, Huobi and Morozov, agreed that they will split the seed six by six. But Huobi said then finally, no, we will leave the seeds with Mr. Turner, with Tabarak which was then finally agreed, which was maybe a mistake, but okay. And so then we started to set up the procedure. Mm. Question. Well, you initiated the wallet to generate the 12-word recovery seed phrase, which I'm going to call shorthand mnemonic. And he answered, because who has the 12 words <coughs> is the so-called mastermind. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, I won't... Uh, if you go back to page 1111 in the um, memory minute document, uh, this is the second page of the memory document. Uh, that second paragraph, it was agreed by the parties that for security reasons, out of 12 security passwords, Tabra actually have six only seen by Tabarak nominated persons, and six words should be with the uh, Russian side, not seen by anybody else. So that that support, uh, uh, all parties agreed upon, and the setup run started. So that that is consistent with the cross examination, except that in the cross examination he makes it clear that uh, that the claimant was offered the opportunity to have the six words, but wanted Mr. Turner to have them. That's not actually mentioned expressly I mean in, what's in, slightly in perplexing minutes. is why it wasn't agreed that only Tabarak would have the twelve words I, yeah. which of course would, met, would have meant the scam would not have worked exactly. so, anyway there we go and, 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 and no doubt if the, on the claimant's side if they'd had any idea of what might have eventuated from the process that was being undertaken as part of the setup, um, they would have um, suggested some or, 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 or agreed to some revision. Yes, well, I mean, I've read the expert evidence, what they thought of the whole process. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And uh, lastly, uh, if you look at 8648, um, you can see uh, at, at the top of the page, uh, Mr. Turner saying the device leads you through the process word by word, which is to be stated then and which is let's say, ordered by Trezor to be on a sheet of paper, which is then to be stored so that nobody has these words. But the device leads you part by part through the setup process. I think what he's saying there is that the Trezor it, it, it is, it is suggesting um, uh, that you write down all, all 12 words on a piece of paper, then verify and, and that completes the setup process. Um, uh, uh, and then at the bottom, uh, just to see where he says in his cross-examination what actually happened, at line 22, uh, uh, well, at line 19, the question was, you just, you, you just allowed it to happen, didn't you? You handed over the device and your laptop to which the device was attached to Mr. Morozov and Alexei. Answer, I handed it over. It was especially, I guess it was Anastasia. We then handed over the device for the, se the second seed words to Mr. Alexa and Mr. Morris Morisov. That's correct. Um, so, so that's really a yes to the question. Um, uh, and over the page, in doing so, you therefore allowed them to scroll up and down and to record all the 12 words. Answer, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I, I'm, I've not allowed them. I even don't know if they did or not did or what they did.
Um, and there's a reference to the drawing of the layout of the room and the position of everybody in the room, which if you'd like to see it and it's helpful, is at 4525. And then I will move on. Uh, you can see uh, Mr. Turner, who's Christian, <coughs> at the right-hand end. Uh, Shushan, Shant, Shantar and Sultan are the sellers' representatives, the Huobi representatives. Anastasia is uh, uh, the assistant to Mr. Turner. And the uh, uh, two Russians, uh, Mr. Moritzov, I think, is referred to as buyer at the far end of the table and his associate, Evgenyev, is uh, uh, next to him on that corner. Evgeny is Mr. Moritzov. No, it's the other way around, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, so you can see how potentially it would be possible for um, uh, some scrolling to take place, the extent of which would not be visible to uh, the claims representatives or Mr. Turner or his assistant, depending on how it was done. Um, and uh, just, uh, 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 you will also find, and I'll just give you the reference because I don't want to spend any longer uh, reading bits out to you. Um, uh, it was clear that the wallet that Mr. Turner had intended to use was a Trezor wallet. Uh, and uh, he regarded himself as knowing how to set up the type of wallet <coughs> with which uh, he was presented by the buyer. You can see that at page 8645 and 8646. I'm not going to go there, I'll just give you that reference. It's, uh, what's the time now? It's, uh, it's 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. With five how minutes. long more would you take? Would you, be, you, you think you, you, take, you, you want... You want to break at one, or you want to break at twelve thirty, or I mean, I think we're quite fine. We can continue. You want? I think yeah. I would have been assuming we would have a hour, an hour break at one. That's what most people are probably working towards. Yes. So. Um, and so you uh, want if, if the court would, would like five minutes now uh, as a break, I'm happy to have a short break, but I'm happy to carry on. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Can continue. Can continue. Okay. Yes, please continue, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> I was about to mention to the registrar we should have a proper, a proper what they call it? Lectern. Black, black, black. Well, so we're going analog, are we? Unfortunately, yeah. we should have a proper one. We will well, make a proper I mean, one. I think the point is. That the court is trying to encourage papers hearings. <laughs> well, you still need to put your laptop for on some, the. For some of us, um, you, you still need to put your laptop on the collection. It's still quite useful. Thank you very much. No, I can, I can survive without the power. I worked out that if we went fully hard copy with this bundle, it would be at least 40 lever art files. What? Uh, 400, and that's 400 pages each. <laughs> There'll be about five, six copies. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you're finished with the facts? I've, I've finished with the, the facts as facts far as on that necessary first to deal, issue. Can we go on the first issue now then? Uh, I want to talk about um, custody, please, first. Okay. Yes, if, yes, yeah, please. I, I, because sure. this is. This is applicable to all of the grounds, yes. and I want to give you the relevant references to enable you to get a proper understanding, as we would suggest, of the um, uh, uh, role of a custodian conventionally in the digital asset world. Yeah, so you're going to be referring to, uh, I know you've referred to a couple of articles and also the Law Commission paper. Yes. Uh, am I... Uh, Am I right in thinking that none of that was put before the judge? Yes. 
Yes, I mean, I, I, maybe well, the article, I, maybe that the article's post-dated, but I think the Law Commission paper predated the, the <coughs> hearing. The Law Commission paper post-dated. Did it? Oh, in that case, in that um, case, then I then I take back. Although control was very much a feature. I'm sure, but no, I was just interested in, in whether he was directed towards the Law Commission paper, but the Law Commission paper was not available no, at the time of trial. That okay, well, that's, that, that's good to know. Thank you. No. No. We can check the dates when we get to them, but I'm, I think that's right. So this is, this is and, and as I think you would have appreciated, Justice Black, um, the reason we've referred to the Law Commission report is because they were prepared by very young uh, academics, lawyers, and technical experts in this field, and they contain a fairly, um, a very useful review of both relevant law but also relevant practice, which I think one can properly uh, take as having some authority. The way that one puts on it will be a matter ultimately for the court, um, but uh, they have. Um, been widely referred to uh, uh, around the world and formed a, a very important part of the process of proposing the new digital assets law in the DIFC, for example, which doesn't follow 100% the recommendations, but nonetheless um, uh, very largely does, and a lot of the information contained in the concept of patient paper uh, and then the final report uh, was important information to enable uh, the DIFCA to make decisions about policy in relation to the new law. Um, uh, and some of the other references are from uh, leading uh, academics or lawyers in the field. Um, I want to start, however, if I may, uh, with the um, uh, expert uh, evidence in this case because that was what was actually before the judge and it is instructive and useful um, and I want to flag up um, various parts of that expert evidence. There was a joint expert memorandum which was agreed between the parties' three experts. Uh, there, was, uh, there were reports from each of the three experts. There was a cross-examination of the experts at trial. The judge um, ruled some parts of the expert evidence inadmissible, and in relation to his decision to rule out uh, a part of the uh, evidence of Mr. McDougall, the claimant's expert, um, that's a subject of a ground of appeal in this case, and I'll come to that in due course. Uh, but uh, the um, uh, judge, in fact, relied and uh, accepted everything that was said in the Joint Expert Memorandum, which is where I'm going to start. And he also accepted parts of Mr. McDougall's evidence as contained in his amended uh, report, uh, and I'm going to look at that as well. Uh, so starting, please, with the uh, Joint Expert Memorandum, it, it begins at 1754, uh, uh, and I'm going to flag up, uh, without reading the sections in full, um, various important sections which you may find useful to go back to. Uh, first of all, on 1756, what is Bitcoin? Uh, there it is, uh, and I'm not going to uh, go into that now, but you can read that in some detail if you wish to. Mm. Further down the page, what is a Bitcoin wallet? This is important. The word wallet is used to describe a few different things in Bitcoin. For the purpose of this report, we would be using the word wallet to describe an auxiliary device or medium that holds or stores private keys needed to access or spend Bitcoin balances that have been allocated to addresses that are part of the wallet. That is the expert's way of expressing that which Justice Black expressed to me um, at the beginning of the hearing correctly. Um, 
It could include a physical Trezor wallet, or it could include a software client on a computer, or a phone, or it could simply be a piece of paper. A common misconception about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin wallets contain Bitcoin. In fact, the wallet contains <coughs> only the keys. Uh, the coins are recorded in the blockchain on the Bitcoin network. Users control the coins on the network by signing transactions with the keys in their wallets. So there you have control of the Bitcoin through the keys in the wallet. Um, in that sense, a Bitcoin wallet is a keychain. Um, then, uh, I won't trouble you with what is a Bitcoin address, but what is a Trezor wallet in the middle of the page? Um, it's a specific brand of hardware-based electronic wallet design device used for managing access to Bitcoin assets. And then, what is a mnemonic phrase? Uh, a seed phrase is a format used for displaying the secret data required by Bitcoin wallets in a way which is human readable and less prone to errors than previous backup formats. The information encoded into this data format allows for the user to back up Bitcoin wallets and subsequently restore transactions. So that's the disaster recovery function that Justice Black referred to. Um, and then uh, uh, 12 to 24 words. This sensitive information is used by the software as the basis for all cryptographic private keys used by the wallet. And then it gives an example. There you have it, uh, Chief Justice, at the bottom of the page of the, of the full 12 words. Um, uh, then um, you have a section headed, how was the Trezor wallet used in this matter? Um, the first paragraph is important. The Trezor device was intended to be utilised as a mechanism for ensuring that the Bitcoin were not exclusively controlled by the buyer nor the seller. Um, in other words, by giving control to the first defendant. And that's the only way in which you can uh, make good that uh, proposal and that purpose and intention. Um, so that was effectively defined the first defendant's role, we say. Um, and then once the funds needed for the purchase were, confer were confirmed, the Trezor device could be used to craft a transaction which transferred the Bitcoin to the buyer's own wallet, which of course would be done uh, by the first defendant, not by the sellers. So again, control. Um, uh, there's a section entitled Configuration and Funding of the Trezor Wallet. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. You can hopefully read that for yourself. Um, but I just flag up the uh, the ninth bit, the, the ninth bullet point. After the mnemonic phrase was recorded, a pin code was then set on the device as part of the setup process. And it says the buyers set up the pin code for the device. That's wrong. I've already shown you the evidence, and the judge found to the contrary. But just when reading this, it's important to note that the experts at this stage were under a misapprehension about the PIN code, and some of their criticisms thereafter are, are, are coloured by that mistake. Then, over the page 1759, how was the Bitcoin transferred out of the Trezor wallet? And four possible breach vectors are put forward by the uh, experts. One, two, three, four. Um, the physical breach theory means that um, you'd actually be able to get into the, the device if you had it in your hand and you had the PIN code, which uh, it was thought that a buyer may have had the PIN code but in fact didn't. So that is probably uh, an even less likely version than it was expressed to be, uh, which was incredibly unlikely. Uh, Breach vector two, the tamper. Just in terms of the facts, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, and it confused me when I read <coughs> when I read this. The second paragraph said that Mr. Ahmadi went out to lunch with the others. I, I don't think he went to Burger and Lobster with them, did he? No, he didn't. No, so that's wrong no, too. That's yeah. wrong. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, vector two, the Tampa Trezor wallet. There's a technical way in which. Um, the Trezor wallet can be, from scratch, uh, made uh, in a way that would enable it to be remotely controlled. Um, that's uh, 
a, a possibility that the experts thought was um, a possibility, but not the most likely explanation of the cause of the theft. Then on the next page, the, the third vector is the C phase scrolling theory. Uh, that's the one that they uh, conclude was the simplest and most likely, and was accepted by the judge, at, 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 uh, coupled with a qualification that he got from subsequently from Mr. McDougall in his report at paragraphs 30 and 40 of the judgment. Um, there's, uh, <coughs> and you can, there's, a, there's a description of how it would have been possible to, 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 to do it and to record or memorise all 12 words. Uh, and the, the experts applying Occam's razor principle say that the simplest explanation is the most likely explanation. Um, uh, the fourth and final possibility was the collusion theory, uh, which they say there's no uh, evidence of, and therefore the most likely, this is 1761 in the middle of the page, are three, seed phase scrolling, or two, uh, uh, tampering, of which three is the most likely. Um, uh, and there's then uh, a uh, section headed standard industry protocols starting towards the bottom of 1761 which merits reading in detail um, and I am not going to take you through it paragraph by paragraph uh, but I highlight for you uh, that there are standard uh, there are industry standards that apply which these experts are applying in their report um, uh, uh, and I highlight on 1762, the second paragraph, uh, well, the first paragraph, the focus of securing Bitcoin is management of the secrets required to authorize the movement of value in, in the Bitcoin network. So there's confidential information involved here, which is relevant to our ground one, and securing Bitcoin uh, it requires proper management of those secrets, which includes obviously the, 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 the codes for accessing either the Trezor wallet or online uh, through the recovery code. And the second paragraph, security of the seed phrase to a wallet, including both the generation of the seed phrase, storage of the seed phrase, and parties who have access to the seed phrase, and the risk of any other party somehow obtaining access to the seed phrase, is the most fundamental and important aspect worth considering when it comes to holding Bitcoin in self-custodial wallets. Highlight that, please. Uh, and and that, that paragraph is obviously, as part of this overall memorandum, one that is, is accepted by the judge. Um, uh, although to what extent he uh, really took into account um, the importance of this uh, aspect of the process against this background is uh, un a little unclear. Um, and on the facts as found by the judge, the first defendant, through Mr Turner and his assistants, had control over the process of configuring the Trezor wallet, including generating the mnemonic and the handing of the Trezor wallet to the buyer during that process at a stage and in a way that enabled the buyer to access a most fundamental and important security code. Uh, that uh, chimes with the paragraph I've just shown you in this report in terms of the importance of that stage of the process, which the first defendant had accepted uh, should, should be undertaken by it through Mr. Turner, not uh, by the seller. And it shouldn't have been by the buyer, but <coughs> in the way it turned out, the buyer did, it was enabled to uh, uh, participate in that process in a way that led to the breach. Um, that's the joint uh, expert memorandum. <coughs> Um, 
I now would like to take you to Mr. McDougall's amended report, which is at uh, 2024. Um, I would like to highlight for you, please, page uh, uh, 2032, that he uh, sets out a series of corrections to the joint memorandum. Um, the uh, I highlight that there's a useful paragraph uh, at the top of page 2033, paragraph 24, he says that the user manual describes the setup PIN process with the following wording, specifically using the word recommended, which implies this process is voluntary and does allow for the Trezor initialization to complete without this step up. So Mr. Turner chose to uh, build in that additional security feature to give uh, the first defendant additional. Uh, control over the Trezor wallet, that is to say additional to this, the, the control that they had physically through holding it in the safe. Uh, assuming that someone had got into the safe or had intercepted the Trezor before it got to the safe, <coughs> without the PIN code they couldn't have got in. Uh, and that's an entirely separate code to the mnemonic which was used uh, remotely, not directly into the Trezor wallet. Um, and then, uh, this is an important uh, section for you to be aware of, on page 2034, correction number three, um, a, a, a phase within the configuration and funding of the Trezor was missed in the list, uh, and here he deals with the process that Manoli Jr. identified for you a few minutes ago, which is uh, that once the 12 words have been generated, you have to lock them in, and to do that, you are uh, given a prompt, and you have to put one of the 12 words in, and if you do that successfully, then it's locked in. If you do it incorrectly, it shows the whole 12 words again. This is where that facet of the process was highlighted in the expert evidence. It hadn't been highlighted in the joint expert memorandum, and the judge accepted this part of Mr. McDougall's evidence at paragraphs 29 and 30 uh, of the judgment 9446. You don't need to look at it, that's just for your reference. If we go to page 2035, here a series of expert opinions are set out by Mr. McDougall, uh, and I want to highlight opinion number one because. It, it will, in due course, be necessary for, the, in order to deal with our ground uh, five, uh, which is, it, it is the ground that appeals the judge's decision to rule, uh, amongst other things, this section uh, uh, as inadmissible in its entirety, uh, the court will need to consider it. Um, but and I don't have time to go through it in great detail, but I want to flag it up and highlight it for you and let you understand what, what it was attempting to deal with so that you can then consider uh, the <coughs> uh, more easily. Um, uh, what the, the overall opinion of this expert was that the defendants were providing escrow services to the claimants. Um, and the judge didn't like that because he felt that that trespassed into territory which was for the court to determine and clearly it, it, the judge was right that uh, the um, it was for the judge to decide what the role played in fact by the uh, uh, parties were was and particularly D1 and whether or not that uh, constituted uh, either a the provision of the custodial service or on the money side, the escrow service. Um, however, uh, that in our submission didn't justify ruling out completely everything that's in this section because this was an expert whose evidence had uh, uh, been accepted in relation to other parts, no doubt in his expertise, uh, and he set out very carefully 
all of the uh, factors that he, as an expert, was able to identify, which led him to the conclusion that what was being provided here was an escrow service uh, and, and involved, uh, through doing so, the taking of control and the uh, provision, effectively, of custody uh, for the Bitcoin. Um, and it, it requires to be read in, 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 in its entirety, but um, all of the factors that he pointed to, all of the indicators that he pointed to, were indicators that as an expert in this field, he was qualified to identify and put up as reasons for reaching that overall conclusion. And we say that what the judge should have done is consider those uh, reasons and the indicators. Uh, if he felt that some of them were inapplicable to the situation in fact before him, he should have identified what those were and thereby... I don't, I, I don't understand as a matter of logic, uh, Mr. Speck, how one can accept that a conclusion is inadmissible, but the reasons going to reach that conclusion should have been admitted. But what, where would those reasons go if not to support the conclusion, which you accept is admissible? No, because I don't accept the conclusion is inadmissible. I, you I, do. You accept, I, that, you accept that it is for the judge to decide what the role is. Ah, well, yes. That, it, it's a difference between whose job is it to decide that overall conclusion and pure admissibility. It, 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 but it's it's what's called the it's, it's what's often called the very thing point, isn't it? That 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 what the what the uh, expert is opining there is the very thing that the judge has to decide. Yeah, overall he is. But uh, it, it, may, I, may I give you an analogy? Yes, of course. Uh, it's it's conventional and common in any sort of professional negligence case where a breach of duty by a professional, be it a lawyer, an engineer, accountant, or whatever is being alleged. For the judge to hear evidence from experts as to what the standard of care is, yes. what what the um, facts are uh, that uh, should be used by the judge to inform him reaching his overall conclusion on standard of care. Ditto here. What the what, the, what I'm, I'm we're not asking we're not saying that the judge should have accepted the overall conclusion of this expert. As it happens, we say that he, for himself, should have come to the same conclusion for himself because the factual and other expert reasons that are put forward for the expert reaching that conclusion were good reasons for the judge for reaching that conclusion. No, I take that point. That's okay. what we say. Okay. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't, in a professional negligence claim, undertake that exercise without getting outside assistance. And a judge who said, I think this professional was careless, uh, negligent, without paying attention to the expert evidence that informs properly the drawing of that overall conclusion, uh, would be vulnerable on appeal. And, and, and so we, we, we invite the court to consider the factors that are put forward here in opinion one uh, and in opinion uh, two, uh, as to, that's on page 2040, uh, as to uh, whether or not, in fact, the judge was right or wrong to conclude that the D1 was providing a custodial or a scrow service. <coughs> I should say um, that the judge uh, didn't say positively that the role was not <coughs> custodian in his row. He described what the role was, and we say his description of that role is in fact a description in the digital assets context of a custodial and escrow role. He then criticised our characterisation of it as custodial and escrow as grandiose, uh, but he doesn't positively say... Uh, that it is not in any sense, for example, custodial or a scroll. Um, and uh, the fact that actually it was, 
we say is evident from his own primary facts, but also is supported by this expert evidence. And I, I flag up for you um, uh, the, uh, lastly, opinion four on page 2041. This is all, we say, admissible evidence from an expert as to whether or not the necessary standards had been met and therefore whether or not there had been a breach of a standard of reasonable care. Um, under our contractual claim, we have, a, uh, uh, we have a, a claim, as you are aware, uh, that uh, uh, is based upon uh, the fact that there was a breach of the contract because the Bitcoin was not transferred back uh, from the control of the first defendant to uh, the claimants. Uh, and that is a breach of contract with or without reasonable skill and care, although there are also, alternatively, reasonable skill and care duties, either expressly or impliedly, within that contract. Where the standard of care is reasonable care, this section uh, is uh, admissible and highly relevant to the question of whether there's been any breach, as are the criticisms that appear in the Joint Expert Memorandum. Um, the judge didn't deal with reasonable skill and care at all because he didn't get to breach because he felt he held that there was no duty. Um, moving on from the expert evidence, um, sorry, just pausing there, uh, and I may have misunderstood what you said a, a moment ago. Uh, this is relevant to a, the tortious claim, not the contractual claim. Is that right? Uh, it, it, insofar as the contractual claim is founded on a breach of an implied duty to take reasonable skill and care, it's relevant to that as well. I, then I hadn't understood that that was the way in which the contractual claim was put. I, I, I'd understood that the contractual claim was put on, on, on a custodianship yes. basis rather than uh, that there was a contract to advise. No, it's not about advice. It's about the, the care with which the custodial. But this, but opinion four, is the advice given by the second defendant was not reasonable. That's what, that's what's confusing me. So. Yes, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I think that, uh, maybe I. I think you misspoke on that. I, I may have misspoken. <coughs> So this goes to the tortious claim in relation to yes, advice, not in relation yeah, I, to... I agree. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, just um, drawing the threads before I move on to the Law Commission and, and the other authorities on this, just drawing um, the threads that come from that expert evidence together in terms of the facts of this case... The aspects of control that we rely on, um, which help to establish the terms of the contract, or in fact, under the tortious claim, assumption of responsibility, um, uh, are uh, as follows. C uh, control of the Bitcoin is effectively custody of the Bitcoin, but it's control that is important. Whether you call it custodial service or a custodial function doesn't matter as such, that form, the substance, is control. Um, and, and under that heading, the um, following points one can make. First of all, the Trezor wallet device is used to control uh, the Bitcoin during the transaction. That's clear from Mr. McDougall's report. Um, uh, in terms of uh, Steps that were taken by the defendant as part of the custody control establishment process, uh, it was the defendant that checked the Trezor wallet for signs of tampering and authenticity. Uh, you can see that from Mr. McDougall's report at 2038. You can also see it from Mr. Turner's fourth witness statement paragraph 23 at page 516. I'm not going to take you to these, I'm just going to give you the references 
Then we have the setting up of the Trezor wallet. The defendant did that, and Mr. Turner accepts that. Fourth witness statement, para 24, page 517. He used his, or the first defendant's, laptop to set it up. Same paragraph of that witness statement. Um, he undertook the uh, generation of the mnemonic, uh, although he did not complete the verification process for the mnemonic until after he intervened by handing the treasure wallet to the buyers. You can see that at Mr. McDougall's report, uh, Paris 30 to 33, at 2034, and at the judgment, paragraph 30, page 9446. You can also see it in Mr. Turner's fourth <coughs> witness statement, para 24, page 517. You have to go a bit more slowly with these references for I'm me. Sorry, but okay. I'm sorry. I'm in transcript mode. Yes. And I, <laughs> I, I apologise. That's okay. Uh, the second defendant's fourth witness statement, para 24, page 517. That's not a complete account, but it gives the structure of what happened. Um, control over access to the physical Trezor wallet device uh, to enable the transfer of the Bitcoin um, uh, using the physical Trezor wallet device. Two things the defendant did. First of all, setting up the PIN code and retaining it, not giving it to either the buyer or the seller. Um, that is something that was omitted from his fourth witness statement at para 24, page 517, but I've given you the reference for his admission in cross-examination. Secondly, putting the Trezor wallet in the safe for safe custody, the only access being the first defendant's Mr. Ahmadi. Um, that's Mr. Turner's fourth witness statement, para 28, page 517, same reference again. Then the next stage is actually using the Trezor wallet to receive control of the Bitcoin. Uh, that requires an address to be generated and provided to the parties. That was done by Mr. Turner on behalf of the defendant, or the first defendant. Same paragraph in the fourth witness statement, same page reference. Uh, and you've also got that appearing in the memory minutes at 1110. That's the start of them. Uh, that's the uh, control of the Bitcoin side. Then on the other side uh, of the transaction, there's the escrow side, uh, checking that the buyer had funds and could transfer them to the uh, first defendant client account. Uh, you can see that in the deal structure emails, and I will also, I don't have it in my note, give you uh, uh, in due course another reference for that. That's proof of ability to transfer money from a relevant account, uh, which the defendant did and that was part of the service that they provided, and then critically receiving the purchase price into an account controlled by the defendant. Obviously it didn't happen, but that account uh, was ready and had been used as part of the test transactions that took place previously. Um, what went wrong? Um, the use by the first defendant of the Trezor wallet um, is generally criticised by all of the experts, joint expert men around them, page 1762 to 3, Mr. McDougall, para 51, page 2040 to 2041. Um, none of that criticism would have mattered, however, but for the second point, which is including the buyer in the setup of the Trezor wallet. Um, including the generation and verification of the mnemonic. Again, criticised by the experts, Joint Expert Memorandum 1762, McDougall, para 51 to 52, page 2040 to 2041. Um, and at a very headline level, how does that play into the contractual tortious analysis? Um, we say that in its capacity as the intermediary which had agreed to and had undertaken responsibility to act as the intermediary, uh, 
the relevant contract was uh, formed and the terms of the contract are as we have intended for, or there is a duty of care in tort, because it was D1 first who would take control during the transaction for the safety of both parties of the Bitcoin and the purchase price payment. Secondly, for which it was to be paid a substantial fee and commission. I've given you the total, 33, US dollars. And thirdly, the first defendant had control over the steps of the process uh, in, involved in getting control of the Bitcoin and the purchase price payment, which led to the theft. I'm so, sorry to rise, but it's the same point I raised earlier, and my learned friend is still not fairly characterising the position. He keeps saying that Mr. Turner intervened in handing over the Trezor to the Russians and that he had control of the steps of the process. The judgment is very clear that handing over the device for those six words to be inserted was something that was agreed to between the buyer, between the Russians, and the seller. So Mr. Never mind, Mr. Hill. When I'm your time rise, comes, you you can. I, 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 I mean, he's, he's raise, raising a lot of issues to show that uh, your client had committed breach of uh, negligence and breach of contract. Yes. Whether there was a contract, we have to decide whether there was negligence, whether the obligation in tort, and also the, he has raised a lot of things, you That's know. Right, and uh, he's also indirectly challenging some of the decisions, findings made by the judge. But, but we'll hear you when. But he's not challenging that finding. I just want to be just want to be clear that that is a finding that's not challenged, and it yeah. does need to be characterised fairly. Uh, and yes. and uh, I think another French misunderstanding, and it may be that I I I am not speaking clearly enough. The fact that the Huobi people in the room agreed to certain <laughs> steps being taken as part of the performance <coughs> of the first defendant's role as the intended custodian, controller of the Bitcoin and the purchase price is, 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 is irrelevant. I think my learned friend is going to try and make something of that, but to our analysis that is irrelevant. There was, in effect, a tripartite agreement between uh, a buyer, seller, and D1 about the role that D1 would play, and D1 agreed to play that role and did play that role. Uh, the agreement uh, evolved over time from the initial documents before the meeting, the discussion before the meeting, and then what happened at the meeting, but at the point that the process started and during it there was agreement as to what the role should be and the first defendant uh, first defendant's role was as a controller or custodian of the bitcoin that was the intended role and in order to play that role it had to ensure that uh, what happened happened properly and safely otherwise by doing something uh, unsafe in the process of setting up the very wallet that was intended to give them the control of the Bitcoin, uh, they render their purpose uh, in the transaction um, undermined because they cannot then keep control over the Bitcoin. That's the, that's the point. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, flag up for you now, if I can, the uh, uh, Law Commission references that I rely on. I'm going to have to take this at some uh, speed and give you references to go back to rather than uh, asking you to read everything as we sit here in court. Uh, the first uh, reference uh, that I will um, take from one of the Law Commission reports and then leave that report is the Law Commission report on fiduciary duties of investment intermediaries. That's at 14297. 14297. 
14,297. Uh, in the glossary to that report, uh, custodian is defined as an institution that is responsible for the safekeeping and administration of assets uh, belonging to another. What page is that on? I'm sorry? What page is the glo that, that? 14,297. So you said in the glossary to that report, we've got the first page of the report is 14297. I'm so sorry. It's 14303. 14303. Thank you very much. It's, it's 14303. 14303. 14303. Staring at me from my notes. I was looking at the wrong line. Sorry, we're looking at the definition of? Custodian. Which is not that page anyway. That's the next page, yes. <laughs> one, four, three, zero, one. Zero, zero, four. Yeah. One, four, three, zero, zero, four. Zero, four, correct. Yeah. Um, specifically in relation to digital assets, I'm going to take you now to the uh, Law Commission's consultation paper on digital assets. That's July 2000 and 22. So that's post trial. Um, that starts at 14591. Um, and custody is defined at 14602. An arrangement under which a person holds objects of property rights for or on behalf of another person and has the capacity to exercise or to coordinate or direct the exercise of factual control, both positive and negative, over such objects. The legal consequences of a custody arrangement will differ depending on the structure and terms of the arrangement. Uh, and on 14604, intermediary is an individual, or more commonly an organisation, which holds an interest in securities or other objects or, or property rights on trust for another. Um, which hints at the fact that the custodial relationship can and very often will give rise to a relationship of trust in the law, the legal sense. You, you, you're saying that um, uh, the defendant falls under the definition of a custodian by virtue of this definition. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying uh -huh. that if you go to 14602, yes. Uh, Custody, yes. that definition, is yes. precisely the arrangement that applied in this case. Okay. So an arrangement under which a, person's, a person holds object of property rights. Here you are saying that defendant is the person who holds objects of the property rights. What is the object of property rights in this context? In our uh, the, case? The, the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin. Yeah. For and on behalf of another person. Yes. For on behalf of the, the Bitcoin your client. case, my client. The client. And has the capacity to exercise, basically to exercise, mm -hmm. or to coordinate, or direct the exercise of the factual control. Now, can, can you analyze that definition and apply that to the facts before us so that I can yes. follow uh, easier? It, 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 it will become a little clearer. Yeah. Um, from some of the other parts of this okay. report, which specifically talk about data <coughs> about, bit, about crypto tokens. Mm. But essentially, uh, the arrangement was that the Bitcoin, or control of the Bitcoin, uh, was transferred to the defendant. That's your allegation, your, that's well, your contention. <laughs> that's your contention. It, it, of course, the, yeah. defen the, the defendant is going to say, the respondent is going to say otherwise. But your well, they may, they may say you're, you're, you're saying that the, the Bitcoin went to the defendants and the defendants to the uh, to the buyer, right? Yes. That's what you are saying. Yeah. And by yeah. virtue of what you're allegate, you're asked us to make that finding of facts. If that is so, then he is a custodian by virtue of this definition. Yes. Right. Precisely. Good. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the Trezor wallet mm. gave, and the security features that go with it, mm. gave the defendant mm. um, factual control 
over the Bitcoin. That because is. by entering the PIN code into the Trezor wallet, the defendant could then um, make arrangements for the transfer of the control of the Bitcoin, the private address that's stored in the wallet to whoever, the buyer or back to us. Okay, that's, that's the control that the defendant had, uh, which enables it to exercise factual control over the Bitcoin. The first, remind me again, the first six digit of the mnemonic, no, no, first six letters of the mnemonic were entered by the defendant. Was it? Uh, they weren't. No, they, they are not a code that they make up. Yes. The Trezor Wallet generated, they generated its own the number. Code they took note. And they took those. note of the first six. Yes. yes. And, and, on, and on its own, mm -hmm. the first six is not sufficient. Yes, I agree. And they were remotely to understand access. that. Yeah. So you are, take, you are saying that because they took note of the six mnemonic words, then they are deemed to have the no. capacity to yes. exercise or coordinate or direct the exercise of the factual control. Is that what you're there, trying to say? I'm, in part, may I just oh, rewind sure. okay, slightly? Please. There are three reasons that they had factual control. The first is they, they actually had the wallet. Yes. First. Secondly, they had the pin code, which enabled you to get into the wallet, if you like. Thirdly, there was a 12-word mnemonic, the use of which would have enabled anybody who had the 12 words to get uh, at the control of the Bitcoin. Okay? If they had retained the six words without the buyer discovering their six words, mm. the fact that they had those six words would have meant that nobody else mm. could remotely access I understand. control of the Bitcoin. I understand and that, that is negative control um, over, over the access to the Bitcoin. If they had all 12, then they would have exclusive, they would have, that would give them another route to or direct access. the exercise of factual control, both positive and negative, over such objects. Yeah. The legal consequences of custody arrangement will differ depending on the structure and the terms of it. Have you got this uh, submission in writing? Is it part of, I don't remember reading this in your submission. Is it part of your submission? No? I'll, no? I'll, 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 okay, uh, Registrar, can, can you take note of this uh, particular page when we get the transcription uh, later on? Because I, I, I want to understand you correctly what you meant, so that it's easier, you know. We'll, we'll, I mean, we'll if, check Or can you put that, what you have said, the application of the definition of custody to your facts, yes. and put in writing to, to me at least, I don't know, Mr. Mr. my colleague, Mr. Justice Black is quite... Maybe they understand, but I just want yeah. to keep that okay. that I mean, argument. I, I, so that a few I, minutes I, ago, I yes. did go through. Yes, you went in quite a lot of detail yeah, what did, the aspects you did, of the you control did, you were. Did. I understood. Understood. Um, all. Okay, fine. It's just Thank this particular definition okay. in application to your set of facts or to our set of facts. Yeah. Okay. That is all I want to know. If you could get uh, one of your uh, assistants there to transcribe something for um, me. A, 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 an important chapter in this consultation paper is, is chapter 11, uh, which starts at 14800. Uh, and, and I flag up for you, I, again, I'm not going to ask you to read it in full now, or I will read out. Um, uh, but uh, this is this is by way of introduction of paragraph 11.1, um, making the point that the fundamental principle of personal property law is that the holder and the owner 
of the object may be two different persons. Um, now, um, the, in the chapter, they go on to discuss what um, holding and having mm. actually mean in the context of data objects. Uh, and, and it's an important um, part of the, of, of the build-up to, to what they say later. Um, I, I've just flagged for you that, uh, obviously, in the case of uh, the, the section to have and to hold, starting at 11.6, on page 14.801 is um, uh, uh, the relevant section um, in, in terms of working out how one holds uh, a, 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 a digital asset as opposed to holding a tangible object like my pen. Uh, in the case of my pen, it's possession. It's tangible. In the case of a data object, like a crypto token, you can't hold it in your hand. You have to find some other concept for uh, describing or, or allocating having or holding. And that concept, as this chapter makes clear, is control. In, in, in the sense that I have already given you in the definition of custody. Okay? Control is central to the concept of having, holding uh, a, a data object. Like In other words, instead of holding physically, mm -hmm. you are holding through mm -hmm. whatever item you are, here yeah. in this case, the wallet. Yeah. But that connection within the wallet is the digital, done, is, exists digitally. Yeah, and you, you, to be clear, you don't necessarily have to have a wallet at all. Ah, yeah, okay. You, you, you could, so who, uh, the, the, the big global Huobi crypto exchange that I was telling you about, who are in the background in the case, uh, don't operate through passing over physical... You can sell your money in the it's bank. All, it's all, it's the, the digital assets are all held effectively on a, on a server <laughs> um, as data. Just yes, like money in the bank now. Yeah. You don't hold it. When you want, you just sign your check or go and cut. And but you've got to have a... You, you've got the right to spend. Yeah. But in, in order to, 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 to work out what the legal relationship is yes. between the person to whom you give control of your Bitcoin, however mm. you choose to do that, mm. you've got to define uh, what... Uh, you've got to find a concept... Mm that describes and gives meaning to that person and that person's holding of your data object. If they have control, then that's the first and key step. And that may well lead to a relationship of trust, a, a, a trust law relationship. It may just be a contractual relationship. I may give you control of my Bitcoin pursuant simply to a contract. Uh, or I may give control of my Bitcoin to you in a way and in circumstances where you are a trustee mm. of my Bitcoin. And it's clear as uh, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, Bitcoin are property, a different kind of property from tangible or intangible property traditionally, but, a, but still property. And the authorities suggest that they are capable of being held on trust. And that is of huge practical importance because if a custodian who holds Bitcoin on trust, whether they are an exchange or just a bank, goes bust, what is the interest in that Bitcoin of the person who gave them the Bitcoin? Are they just one of the general pool of creditors or are they, are they, a, do they have a trust? Well, it's that? just like the bank. The only thing is the bank, you can convert the money into pieces of paper. Whereas here, it remains digital yeah. forever. Yes. It, you it, want, what's the time now? It's five to one. Can I just give you a couple sure. more references it's, it's before we cool, break, please? please. Um, uh, if you go to 11, uh, 14819. One, this is the, 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 the part of the to have and hold section that deals with control. Um, and 
that at 11.76, uh, it makes the point that the most viable alternative to an extension of the concept of possession is the development of a new but functionally similar concept that is more sensitive to the idiosyncrasies of data objects. Um, uh, and in 77, we think that such a concept, which we explain in detail below, might be labelled control. Uh, what is control in this context is an obvious question. If you go to 1184, um, uh, that's page... 14820. Uh, in chapter 4, we provisionally conclude the most appropriate way for the law of England and Wales to accommodate certain types of data objects uh, is as members of a distinct third category of personal property. And then in 11.85, um, uh, in many examples of data objects, the quality of rivalness rivalrousness will em emerge as a consequence of the design rules of a particular technological network or system. And then the key sentence is uh, that um, this means in general that the ability factually to determine access to the data object can be sufficiently concentrated into a single person's hands. In general, we think that the person who is able to exclude others from and make use of a rivalrous data object should be recognised as having control of that object. That is, uh, the, the, that is, in the case of a data object such as a crypto token or Bitcoin, that is um, uh, the fundamental principle that underlies the definition of custody that I took you to earlier. Um, and at, at 11.109, that's on page 14827. I flag up for you the uh, legal significance of a concept of control, um, uh, and that there is a uh, an important section here. But the most important, by way of summary, paragraph is subparagraph three on the next page, one eight four two eight. Custody or custody-like arrangements. Um, and I would invite you to read the whole of that paragraph and take note. Because applied to the facts of this case, uh, the control that the first defendant had uh, or was intended to have as part of its role uh, falls within... Uh, that uh, <coughs> of a custody or custody-like arrangement. Uh, the conclusion is at 11.110 at the bottom of 14829. That might be a convenient moment to break if that's acceptable. That's a lot for us to swallow. <laughs> I was just thinking as when you were making the submission, you know, whether parties and I know I've got to consult my colleagues, my judges, whether we could sort of in our judgment we could start right, you know, explanation what this case was about factually and the binding fact of fact, uh, the finding of facts that we could circulate that part of the judge judgment so that the experts can correct the way we express and how you know before you come to the finding of the law applicable to that <laughs> because our judgment is going to be the judgment you know and I don't like later on people say this is wrong technically what the judge has mentioned is judgment is wrong and, uh, you know, well, just one, an idea. May I just say this yes. on that? One of the reasons that I am taking up quite a bit of time mm -hmm. identifying key passages in the expert evidence and in the Law Commission report and in one or two other texts, which I'll have to deal with after the break, is so that the correct way to approach it is clear to the court from those authorities. I, I suspect that if you were to suggest that 
draft judgment containing technical descriptions and facts was to be sent to the parties. Um, we would do our very best to assist the court in agreeing, but it might be quite a complicated process. <laughs> no, the way what we and, say, and the ex expression, the way we say yeah. it, and things like that. I've done that when I was the Chief Justice in Malaysia once. Sure. But I understand your Court of Appeal has done that, circulated judgments, but they circulate the full judgment only to the two councils sure. before they make it public. To, so that you correct whatever. Well, that that is that's and in the English Court of Appeal or, or in the High Court that would be conventional. Yes. Um, and uh, it's only to. It's usually only for typos and obvious corrections to be made. It's it's conceivable that the court might invite some observations on a particular technical passage, mm -hmm. although I think the court is usually reluctant to engage in that sort of dialogue at the judgment stage. No, it's it just has, in that. It has to it's make just its an mind idea. up. It's got plenty of material available to it to enable it to make its mind up. But anyway, I, those are just, just observations. Just, it's just an idea I'm, I, I will discuss with you. Just so that we use the right words, yes. you know, in the right way. You say the right things correctly, technically, you know, so that uh, the conclusion is going to be the same, whatever we see. But, yes. Um, excuse me, Paul, we will be circulating in due course um, a, the list of authorities mm -hmm. with, with the PDF references as well, unfortunately, because of I've the handed it delay. Up. Oh, we've got that. I do apologise. Mm -hmm. Second point, mm -hmm. um, about the photograph, mm -hmm. uh, joint expert report, it was agreed that it was a Trezor T model Model. If you look um, anywhere on the internet, it's obvious that the Trezor T wallet is touch screen. It's not. It doesn't have buttons as such. Okay. So that photograph is representative. Thank you. But I took the well, notice. let's uh, just for the sake of understanding what it is, what it is. I'll use that for myself. I'll use that photograph as. So I'm not. I'm still not clear. Yeah. Sorry, whether there is any agreement as to whether that was the model that was used on the third of February. It's in the joint expert report. All the experts. Agree they agree that that was the model yes, used. So that it wasn't. It wasn't the model with the buttons. It was the model with the. Correct. Uh, you have the Trezor One model. Yes. Model which is a much cheaper version than the Trezor T, which does have a button, and the Trezor T is is the touch screen version. Okay. Uh, if I may add one thing on that point, in the. Mr. McDougall, the claimant's expert, revised expert report. He has a footnote, footnote four, which is the reference is 2033, and that has a link to a wiki page, which is the Trezor website, and that gives a detailed explanation of setting up the wallet. And also, there's a video that the claimants have put forward in their reply closing submissions that references 9120, and in a footnote in that, they have a YouTube video which shows an explanation of how to set it up. But it's not really important to our our decision. I think it's just a matter of you know, just curious to know how it looks like. And now it's one o five. Uh, what time shall we come back? Normally, what's how long do you take? I'm not sure. Normally, I I want to. Uh, how long? One hour. Enough for you to go. Enough for you to go rush for lunch and come back. One hour. Okay. So that's uh, 205, or 5, 2 p.m., 205. Okay? All, All right. right. Thank you very much.
I understand you all want to sit late today. Well, can we? Um, I know. We are very grateful to you for considering us. Uh, um, uh, uh, we, we are. Yeah. In, uh, where, could we see how what progress we make in the next couple of hours before yes. making a final decision about what Sub time we finish? But if you are going on to five o'clock or five past five, uh, I would like to. You have to stop round about one and a half hours from now. Certainly. Ten minutes, five minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, I'm sure that yes. um, I will certainly be very Good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, if I may uh, go back to where we were, um, I was taking you through uh, the principal um, uh, reference or indeed authority on custody control in the context of digital assets, which is the Law Commission consultation paper from July 2022. Uh, I want to conclude in that paper uh, with chapter 16 uh, and as with I'm going to ask you to look at one or two specific paragraphs but uh, more generally w when I come to deal with other references I'm going to in order to be a bit more economic with the time 
give you <coughs> paragraph references. Yes, I think you, you've you taken a lot of your time, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Doesn't well, matter how I, you I, want I to I want you it. to have the information as to yeah, where the proposed propositions are to be found, so I will give you the references, but yes. I'm not going to take you through them. Um, all uh, at all, but it, I, I will ask you just to have a, 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 a open chapter 16, which is at um, 14937. <coughs> um, and I flag up first of all paragraph 16.1 14937, uh, which uh, recognizes that the owners of crypto tokens and the Bitcoin is a crypto token routinely deploy their objects of property rights, their crypto tokens. So there you have the object of property right, specifically being identified as a crypto token, Chief Justice, in facilities and arrangements which, in which they relinquish a degree of direct control over access. This might be for a variety of purposes, and that includes access to specific trading markets. So relinquishment of control uh, and trading are, are very much interlinked. That's an important background factor. 16.3. Um, Crypto token markets and market participants frequently use the term custody to describe a number of different kinds of facility, arrangement, or relationship. Um, and they uh, uh, consider later in this chapter what, what, what such facilities or arrangements uh, uh, can constitute custody relationships and the different legal consequences that flow. So we're right in the territory that's relevant to this case. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, note in paragraph 16.5, and, and of course, it, it, custody, therefore, uh, 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 simply denotes some form of factual arrangement. Um, it's a question of deciding whether it, if the control is such that it is a custody arrangement. <coughs> That's the consequence of 16.3. Uh, 16.5, uh, the third sentence, crypto tokens are the principal type of data object for which such custody arrangements have developed in the market. So that's recognizing that for crypto tokens such as Bitcoin, custody arrangements in the market are common and have been developed. Uh, 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 uh. So it's, it's not a novel concept that the judge was being asked to consider. But, but he didn't have the benefit of, of this explanation. No, he did not. Uh, of course not. And uh, uh, that's why I'm yes. respectfully um, inviting the court here to review the contract uh, in, in the light of this more um, detailed and helpful explanation. Um, uh, it's not a criticism of the judge that he didn't appreciate all of this. Um, uh, it, 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 it does potentially, however, indicate that in the result his ruling was wrong. But that's a different point. Um, uh, and uh, if you can go to 1610 at 14938, next page. Here's a very helpful uh, definition specifically given in the context of crypto tokens. Uh, the, 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 the early definition of custodian was more generic. Uh, and, 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 and there it is. Uh, I'm not going to read it out. But that is... Uh, a description of an arrangement which we would submit uh, can also be applied to the arrangement in place in this case. Uh, uh, and if you want to understand more about the concepts of positive and negative control, which were two, which were, which is part of the definition of custody, uh, 16.12 uh, explains that uh, on page. 14939 and 1615 uh, is, is a, a explanation of what a direct custodian is uh, and we say that's 1615 on the same page 14939 the first defendant was uh, clearly a direct custodian in accordance with that paragraph what else could they be, and no other capacity is put forward. Uh, therefore, um, we submit that that should guide the construction that the court puts on the contract between the parties and or 
the tortious relationship between the, 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 the assumption of responsibility for the purpose of the tortious argument. That's the end of that of the Law Commission consultation. I'm going to stick, skip over the final report uh, because most of the work is done in this report and nothing uh, of great additional significance is in the final report. Nothing changed. Uh, the next reference to flag for you is the article uh, by Hin Liu, Louise Gulliver and Henry Chong, um, Client Intermediary Relations in the Crypto Asset World, etc., at 15505. Um, the authors are, at least in, in, in the first two, uh, preeminently uh, eminent in this field. Uh, Hin Liu is a lecturer of law at the University of Oxford, closely involved with working with the law commissioners in England and Wales on the development of their final proposals, uh, as well as the DIFC in the development of theirs. Uh, and Louise Gulliver probably needs no uh, introduction, but she's the Rouse Professor of English Law at the University of Cambridge. She's responsible for the Unidois Digital Assets and Private Law Working Group, uh, which has produced a set of international principles designed to facilitate the transactions in digital assets. So they are uh, uh, extremely eminent in this field. Um, and I flag for you, um, just for context, without reading them out, the first and third paragraphs by way of, uh, on this page by way of introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, that third paragraph goes over to the next page. Um, uh, moving on. Uh, the uh, fourth paragraph uh, floats the possibility that uh, a trust relationship, this is on page 15506, may arise. Uh, and under the heading at the bottom of that page, section 2, crypto asset custody, the possible legal relationships, um, I rely on uh, this section uh, in general. Um, uh, in particular, I flag up the definition of custodian that they have adopted from Blatt's Law Dictionary in the first paragraph under that heading, um, and the uh, following paragraphs that talk about what holding a crypto asset uh, means in the context of uh, this sort of case. Um, and if you go to the final paragraph of that first little section, which is on 15.507. Uh, you can see that they introduce the next section of this um, uh, uh, article with a reference back to Black's Legal Dictionary, which says that the duties owed by a custodian of property to its client generally include securing, safeguarding, and maintaining the property in the condition received and accounting for any changes in it. That's very apposite to this case, we would say. Ultimately, the precise duties owed in each individual client-custodian arrangement will depend on the terms of the contract, we would agree. Such duties are determined, at least initially, by the legal categorization of the arrangement, title transfer, trust, etc. Um, and uh, trust is dealt with, uh, just by, to flag it up for you, under heading B on page 15508. And I would uh, commend the uh, bottom paragraph, the first paragraph under that heading, and then going over to 15509 at the top of that page. And I no you will note, um, Justice Black is probably familiar, I think, with uh, uh, these authorities, reference to Cryptopia and uh, Coin, which are um, Commonwealth authorities in this area, uh, which uh, discuss whether digital assets can be property and whether they can be held on trust. Um, and finally, um, on fifteen I'm so sorry. In order for there to be a trust, there has to be the satisfaction of the three certainties, which I won't go into, but that's trite trust law. And on 15, um, 
15510, uh, uh, further discussion about uh, trusts, and uh, you see, uh, this is a reference to what I was saying earlier, in the um, third complete paragraph on this page, starting there are various consequences, uh, the authors discuss what the consequences of assets being held on trust are. Uh, and the third of those is that a trust relationship imposes a baseline set of obligations on the trustee. And there we, we have it. Um, now, uh, it is correct that uh, the relationship in this case uh, was not originally pleaded as a trust relationship. It's pleaded on the basis of contract and negligence. Uh, it, in our submission, it could have been pleaded on the basis of trust. It doesn't need to be for the relief that we seek to be uh, obtained. But as this paper demonstrates, in a circumstance such as this, where you hand your crypto assets over into the safekeeping of a custodian, um, that will uh, very often fulfil the characteristics of a trust. Uh, but, but you said trust was not pleaded. No, no. I'm just explaining the relevance of this. Uh, but we are in that territory. It can be a contractual arrangement, which we say it was. But in terms of uh, the uh, uh, type of arrangement that we're talking about, it is the sort of arrangement which could be construed as a trust. Um, uh, uh, the facts that would support a trust are, are certainly pleaded, but the pleader did not seek specific trust-based remedies. Um, and I'm, I'm merely uh, illustrating to you, because it's important that you have a, a, comp you have a comprehension of, of, of what the types of relationship in this sort of case are, and the fact that no trust-based remedy was pleaded on the basis of the pleaded facts doesn't detract from the fact that we're in that sort of territory uh, through the operation of the contract that we would say was in place. Um, and and the, uh, much of what is said uh, in the, the, this paper, for example, in discussing the question of whether something is or is not a trust is perfectly opposite to our arrangement. Uh, that's um, all I will show you in... Uh, Hin Liu, uh, and the last reference that I'm going to flag up for you, and I'm just going to give you the references now because I don't want to scroll through it at all, even that was quite a quick scroll, but this is um, the Kerrigan textbook, a relatively new textbook produced by a partner at the international law firm CMS in London with collaboration, collaboration and input from a wide range of people. Uh, including members of the English Bar. Um, it's to be found at 14248. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you the following references for your note, which are of relevance. Uh, first of all, um, uh, you'll see that he, uh, uh, at, at uh, uh, paragraph 4013 at 14250, uh, he sees this in the same context as the Law Commission, which is um, uh, uh, expressly referred to, and uh, he talks about the importance of achieving an international consensus about the legal approach to digital assets in that paragraph, and uh, we say that this case is an important part of the process of achieving that international consensus. It is the DIFC Court's contribution to that process. Um, then uh, the uh, most significant chapter is chapter 14. It starts at 14259. Uh, you have a, 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 a similar definition uh, to, uh, uh, it, this is a chapter dealing with wallets, I should have said. Uh, the definition of a wallet is given at 14001, 14259. That is similar to the definition of uh, the uh, device uh, def as defined by the uh, experts, just supporting them. 14002 
uh, at 14259. Um, that uh, very much reflects the Law Commission um, uh, with, uh -huh. the, with, the, with the wallet holder it retaining control over the private keys being the key factor in the context of a, uh, a physical uh, or digital wallet. Um, uh, at 14.004.14260, uh, a uh, wallet holder is responsible for their own security and is required to safeguard their own private keys. At 14.005.14263, in the first paragraph there, there is a description of a custodial wallet, um, which is uh, opposite to this case. At 14.008. 14266 to 7. Uh, there is a description of the legal rights over assets held in a custodial wallet, uh, which is um, similar and supportive of the Law Commission's analysis that I've already taken you to. Uh, and lastly, Chapter 18 is entitled Custody, Control, and Intermediated Holding Services for Crypto Tokens, which sounds a pretty terrifying title. Uh, uh, and very technical, but it, it, it isn't when one reads carefully into it. I uh, draw your attention to 18001 at 14271, in particular the second paragraph, 18002 at page 14272. We say, on the basis of that paragraph, that assuming that a new Trezor wallet was used, as suggested in this case, Tabarak's role was that of a custodial holding intermediary, as described by Kerrigan. Uh, and lastly, at 18008, page 14278, uh, this is about custodial uh, intermediated holding facilities. And 14279, he helpfully sets out the three certainties for establishment of a trust, uh, showing the particular... Uh, uh, <coughs> ease with which that relationship can be established on the facts of, of, of a kind that apply in this particular case. That's the end of my uh, section of submissions on uh, uh, control and custody, uh, uh, and I, I hope it was of assistance to the court. Uh, I'm now going to move on to deal, please, with uh, ground one. <clears throat> Thank you. If you just give me one moment to reorganise, that would be appreciated. Now, uh, for your reference, uh, we deal with ground one, which is our claim for breach of confidence we say is a, a, a pure appeal on a point of law. Uh, it's dealt with in our skeleton argument uh, at uh, page 11229. And I, without repeating it, reading it out, uh, rely on what we say uh, in our skeleton <coughs> in relation to this ground. And I'll develop uh, one or two points uh, it, 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 in that uh, in the next few minutes. This case is all about, this ground is all about um, <coughs> uh, 
um, uh, Article 37. Uh, it is Article 37 that creates, we say, a new and standalone duty which is defined within the body of Article 37. And we say, contrary to the case put forward by the second defendant in their written <coughs> submissions opposing this appeal, second defendant, that it is simply wrong that, as they say, in order to establish a breach of the duty <coughs> referred to in Article 37, you have to go off and find some other duty that was breached under the law of obligations, such as the duty under Article 18 or <coughs> Article 20. <coughs> and that uh, that justifies the judge's approach of relying on the facts that he had relied on in holding that there was no duty owed under Article 18 or 20, uh, and carrying that across effectively to uh, Article 37. That is, we submit, wrong. We don't understand that to be a point that's taken by the first defendant, uh, uh, who we think, from their submissions, and we'll hear more about it in due course, and it'll be easier to follow at that point, but we think uh, are at least looking within Article 37 for the answer to this case. But the suggestion that you go outside uh, to find an actual duty established elsewhere and then carry it across is incorrect. It's probably, for what it is worth, a point that ought to have been uh, raised by a respondent's notice by the second defendant. But in any so event, it's clearly of wrong. Article 37 says, subject to Article 34, a person has a duty not to misuse specific information which has received from another a confidant directly via intermediary and which can reasonably be regarded as confidential when he knows or ought to know what information is confidential, that the confidential is. Yeah. How, do, how do you apply this to your facts? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, first of all, may I make the observation that uh, this tells you what the duty is. Yes. So that's my first point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the application is... Um, you wish to follow it through, uh, set out in paragraph 28 of our skeleton at 11231. So, I think, uh, page 11231, paragraph 28. This is where in our skeleton argument we tell you how it applies. We've, before that, we've said that negligence as such is not required. I... Uh, May I, before explaining the application, Chief Justice, may I just remind you that the judge's ruling on Article 37 was a brevity in the extreme. Paragraph 112 of the judgment, uh, you don't need to get up on your screen, so I'm going to read it to you, but it's page 9488. He says, for the reasons given above, for the finding that Tabarat was not liable in negligence for the loss of the 300 BTC, Tabarak did not misuse the alleged confidential information. So, uh, the judge is, is apparently, without any analysis of an Article 37, um, the judge is apparently taking um, reasons that he give, gave for not um, holding that there was, a, there was negligence elsewhere in his judgment, as the same reasons for why Tabarak did not misuse the alleged confidential information. What he doesn't do in the judgment is tell us at all what he means by that. What's his reasoning? What aspects of what 
uh, took place that he relied on in relation to negligence amount to Tabarak not misusing the information. I mean, there are two points here. The first point is whether or not um, this is your confidential information. And yeah. the second point is whether they misused it. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's it. That's what this point is that's, about. That's all it's about, yeah. It, it, it's so certain. how come it's your information if it's generated automatically by the uh, Trezor wallet? Because, it's gen it, because gener uh, the answer to that question is it's generated by the wallet for the protection of our interests. It was intended, the proposal initially was that we would get our six words. We would actually be handed them. Instead, we asked, and Mr. Turner agreed to hold the six words. And I took you to that evidential reference uh, earlier today. That half of the mnemonic was our, or Mr. Turner, if he's holding it on our behalf, our way of as long as it wasn't disclosed, those first six words protected our mean. Bitcoin because it meant that they could not be... I'm sorry to realize that is just contrary to the judgment. The original proposal was that the six words would be held noted by Tabarak, the remaining six words noted by the director. Yes, that's right. That, that is what happened, but I've already taken the court to the evidence before that shows how that position was arrived at. Mr. T Mr. Turner said uh, in cross-examination that the original suggestion was that the claimant, Huobi, would have their six words, but it was agreed, and that is the agreed position that the judge is recording there in the judgment, that Tabarak, through Turner, would hold them. <coughs> The idea that wait, wait, it's... Wait. I, it go back, I go back to 37. I'm a very simple person. I just want to understand. 37.4, subject to Article 74. A person has a duty. A person means the defendant. Yeah. Has a duty not to misuse specific information. What is this specific? The, the mnemonics. Is the the mnemonic. specific, The specific information which he has received from another. Which has received from the machine, from from from, from the from the uh, treasure wa no, yeah. treasure wallet, okay. And you are treating treasure wallet as a confidant. No, I'm treating the, the the person who who's no, the treasure wallet isn't a confidant. You're treating so. it as your pleading or your submission is that it's an intermediary. Yeah, and it's that an you intermediary. Can, yeah. Intermediary, intermediary. Yeah. yeah. Well, Our confidential he says here, <laughs> I'm reading from here. Has received yeah. from another a confidant. So it has received from whom? I think this question was posed by Justice Black. Received from whom? Received from the treasure wallet. The intermediary, yes. The word intermediary appears in paragraph one. Directly or via intermediary? Directly yes. or via an intermediary? That machine is the intermediary. Yes, yeah, so your, their submission, yeah. your submission is that the, uh, the half of the mnemonic that the machine generated was as your intermediary to protect your Bitcoin. That's yes. your submission. Exactly. Yes. And if we had had um, no Mr. Turner involved, just us and the buyer in the room, we would have written down our six words ourselves. And as long as those six words were not disclosed to the buyer, they couldn't have got in and taken the Bitcoin. Simple as that. In fact, Mr. Turner wrote down and received our six words, if you like. That was on any basis confidential information. No, there's no doubting that because you can test that because the moment it's disclosed, uh, it is of great importance and enables the crime to take place. So that is the uh, reception. Uh, and 
There is no doubt, to continue with the application, Chief Justice, that Mr Turner, D1, knew, or ought to have known, that the first six words were confidential. So he was, what, in fact... What, what, how did he misuse uh, that that's information? The second, that's the second that's question. That's the second question. <laughs> the second question. <laughs> okay. Misuse is defined, to some extent, in, sub, in Article 37.4. Misuse of information includes but is not limited to its disclosure. Now, there is no negligence test here for misuse. That's my primary submission. And to suggest that there is, we say is wrong, if that is the suggestion. If in the mind of the judge, <coughs> the information was not misused, because in his view they hadn't been careless is irrelevant for the purposes of Article 37. Misuse includes disclosure. It was disclosed because... But, but, but that's, that's, that's putting the cart before the horse. Because misuse can include disclosure, but disclosure is not necessarily misuse. I can disclose... Uh, I mean, you, the, 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 the article itself sets out which disclosures are not misused. Yes. So, but any clearly, other. clearly, and, well, you don't, not any other. I mean, the, the, those are, those are uh, uh, that's a non-exhaustive list of, of, uh, of disclosures that would not be um, uh, uh, misuse. But there may be, there may be other, there may be, uh, there may be actual agreement uh, well, no, actually, no, that's included in... Let's assume it's exhaustive. I'm not sure it is, but let's, it, let's assume that's an exhaustive list because it, it doesn't make any difference to my point. My point is that misclosure, disclosure per se is not misuse. In the context of the... Uh, oh, well, that's a different issue. If you're talking about context, that's no, fine. No, no, I, I, may I... Yeah, of course. I wasn't going to talk about the context of this... Program. Okay. <laughs> In the context of the legal doctrine of misuse of confidential information, the, the root of this is the English equitable uh, obligation, obligation of confidentiality. And my, my authority for that is the text Tulsum and Phipps, which, for your note, is at 14130. It's section J, tab 40 of the bundle, 14130. Uh, and, uh, again, because I do not wish to take up time trawling through pages of textbooks, uh, I rely on the paragraphs that appear uh, in our authorities list. Uh, 2002, 2004, 3001, 2004, 3006, 3043. I can't take it then. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. They're, in, they're, they're on that list. I, I, I do, I do apologise. I'll start again so that you can write it down, Justice Black. 2002 to 004. 3001 to 004. 3006. 3043 to 045 and 046. 3106 to 110. 111, 112, and 117. <coughs> 4001 to 5. And finally, under the topic of misuse, 5001 to 002, 004, and 006. And the page references for those specifically are 14141 to 14142. And in that section of Tulsa and Phipps, they distinguish between uh, misuse, uh, effectively strict liability for misuse uh, under the equitable doctrine, where the information is confidential, where the discloser knows that it's confidential or ought to have objectively, and where it is disclosed. Um, by that person. Uh, they distinguish between that, on the one hand, and 
uh, a negligence approach to confidential information, which can happen in other situations where there is a duty of care. That's dealt with in 5009 to 5011. Sorry, Mr. Spring. I'm, I'm, I'm very slow today. Uh... And under the act, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I, I'm going back to disclosure. What is it that if the defendant was supposed to have disclosed? The six words. To who? Of, to to who? the buyer. Because he handed over the wallet. But at that, a point that wasn't it his duty to do so? Because there is the agreement to do so. No. I'm just complying with the requirement no. of his, the agreement. His duty was to, to act as the custodian and take control over the bit. Where, where, where is this fact? Well, where is this agreement? Where is this agreement that he is supposed to hold for himself and not to disclose to anybody? The, you the, know, if I disclose something with your consent, hmm. that is not disclosure under that 37, obviously. Yeah. We, but if I disclose without your consent, here, He's disclosing with your client's consent no, in your presence. No, he's absolutely no? not. No, no, Chief Justice, you, you, with respect, okay. you, you, you mustn't make that mistake. Uh. Uh, he, what, my he, clients did uh. not consent to the disclosure to the buyer of those first six words. Oh. It was Mr. Turner handing them the wallet when they were still able to scroll through Ah. That was the disclosure, and the, we did the, not the, consent the to that. situation in which it was disclosed. Yeah. You were supposed to dis allow the disclosure, but not in ways that the buyer is able to yeah. read the six. Sure. Because that's, otherwise, otherwise that, that's your contention. Yeah. That's your contention, that's isn't absolutely it? Absolutely right. We I mean, disclosing the mnemonics is one thing, but n disclosing and allowing. The, the 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 buyer yeah. to be able yeah. to have access to the other six or the six that he has supposed to hold for himself that was the problem yeah that was the dis that is the disclosure that you're referring to that is correct good. and we can test it this way yes Chief Justice, yeah sorry. please go on we can test it this way if mr turner had said to my clients in the room i'm now going to give them the wallet mm. and in so doing They'll be able to scroll up and see your six words. And we'd said, fine, go ahead. Sure. That disclosure of our confidential information has been done by our consent. Mm. But we did not consent to them doing that. Obviously not. Either to scroll yeah. or All to we consented to, all we consented to, was the splitting of the mnemonic and the sharing confidentially to each party of one half. That has to be... That has to be the correct construction of what happened. The idea that we consented to our half, or Mr Turner's half, on our behalf of the mnemonic, being disclosed through <laughs> any part of the process is ridiculous because clearly our concerns, which were evident and which the judge accepted we had initially until we were reassured by Mr. Turner, uh, our concerns would have been very considerable at that point and it would have been obvious that a major uh, loophole had been introduced. So to construe what happened as us giving consent to the disclosure to uh, the uh, buyers, as in fact happened, of the first half of the mnemonic, mnemonic must be wrong. Thank you for laughing at my... I do it all the time. I, yeah, I've, I've, Even the I, I, my hit rate's probably 80% correct, but there's a <laughs> solid 20% where I get the M and the N the wrong way around. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's my case. Okay. Uh, 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 and that's your case on. That, that's my case on on what on, on Article the Thirty Seven uh, on what is misuse and that disclosure in the way that it occurred here certainly 
without consent, um, okay. it, it, the, it is the, a breach the, of the duty. And, and, and if I may say so, uh, it's, it's a very important point, indeed, for the, for, 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 for the, for, um, the business, if I can put it that way, uh, because whose information this is, whether it's confidential, and whether the intermediary allowing it to be seen by the other contracting party uh, breaches this article is an important point which we need to have determined. And this, um, this non the, the non disclosure of this information to the buyer is by way of implication to the terms of the contract. No. Right? No. 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 The duty not to misuse the confidential information in the mnemonic is a breach of straight out of Article 37. 37. Breach whether of we have a, it doesn't matter whether we have okay, a contract. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a breach of 37. In and, and let's say we got a, a helpful person to come in off the street and said, right, we want you, please, to act as an intermediary. We want you to hold the wallet, we want you to set it up, we don't want any of our confidential information disclosed, and if that person accepted that role and undertook it and did disclose, whether there's a contract or not, that is a breach of, okay. and that's because the equitable doctrine of confidentiality yes. and Article 37 of the DIFC law um, is enshrining the importance of the protection of important confidential information. Why isn't why isn't the half of the mnemonic, if it's confidential information at all, <coughs> Tabarex confidential information in the uh, exercise of their duty to protect the Bitcoin? Uh, because it's not, uh, it is an item of information that protects our Bitcoin. Yes, but if if you if you if you do well in this appeal uh, and you uh, establish that they were custodians, then isn't then wouldn't the um, uh, wouldn't that confidential information simply be part of the modality of its custodianship? rather than your confidential information? Well, that... I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll reflect a little further on that, if I may. I see the question, I see the point. Um, I'm not disposed immediately just to agree with your Lordship. I can quite see, I, I, Justice Black, I can quite see the point you make, that um, if we do well on the custodial arrangement, on, under the contract, well, you don't need it we, anyway. We, we don't need it anyway. <laughs> but but but, but you but, know, once once one wants to analyze everything out. But obviously. but but there is a. Um, it is important to analyze it because this could happen in the context of a of a of a non-custodial arrangement. I think the one I posited to you of someone coming off the street, um, uh, which sounds a bit casual, but nonetheless, if you are a holder. If you are a receiver of someone's confidential information, uh, you can acquire people's confidential information by accident. No, I mean, the court the court is very conscious that this is a very early decision on, yeah. on these matters, and it's yeah. likely to be poured over. So we're the idea to that, take some care with it. Uh, uh, of course, of course, yes. <laughs> I, I'm very well aware of that, and yeah. I'm and I approach this appeal, I hope, with that in mind. <coughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to I, I'm actually trying to pare back as much as possible the, the factual disputes and the appeals on fact and focus in on the legal analysis applied to, applied to the judges uh, the legal analysis I, I'm smiling because I'm thinking of county court judges in front of whom I appeared 20 years ago when mobile phones first came in <laughs> and the comments that they made if a, if, a, if, a, if a phone went off in court. Well, I don't think we're going to commit anybody quite yet. No, that, that was one threat. <laughs> 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 I do apologise. Yes. 
I'm uh, uh, not at all critical of Manny Jr. It happens to us all. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so far as possible, to try and plot a path for the court through the different grounds based on the facts that the judge found, the facts that the judge could have found but didn't, but could easily have done and ought to have, and only where it's absolutely essential to say you've got to consider overturning a particular finding of fact. That's, that's my, my approach to this appeal, uh, generally. Uh, so uh, my, I rest my submission at the moment on Article 37 on the basis that this is our confidential information as it relates to our Bitcoin and its disclosure causes us harm. Its disclosure didn't cause or wouldn't have caused Tabarak any harm directly at all. It, so it, 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 in that sense, it is our information. Um, it's about me. It's about us. Um, that's ground one. Um, it, 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 it's just important to emphasise, I'm sure you've spotted this, but just to flag it up for you, um, obviously at Article 37.5, the carve-outs for disclosure are set out, um, and we discussed those briefly, I don't want to dwell on those, um, but none of them apply here. Uh, and six, it's no defence that the defendant did not know <coughs> that he was misusing the confidential information. In other words, if he makes an accidental disclosure, that will be engaged. Ah, well, now, uh, yeah, I, I thought that you were slightly coy in your drafting of, of your um, uh, skeleton. Uh, because you rather repeated that in saying it's no defence that the defendant did not know he was disclosing the confidential information. What it says there is that he was misusing the confidential information. Rather different. Mm. Well, I, I, if, that, if by that Justice Black was suggesting that that's a reference to some sort of me mens rea type knowledge, no, but, um, but we go exactly. back to the point I made before, that, that disclosure is not misuse per se. It, it, well, I'm, I'm not accepting that point. Okay. Uh, it is subject to the carve-outs. Yes. If it's confidential information, and if... Well, I'll, I'll, read, I'll, read, I'll read all those sections in, yeah. in Tools and Fibs. Thank you. Um, uh, I haven't read them in advance, so no, you'll, you'll forgive me if my questions are not as well informed as They're, they might be. They are laser-like in their pertinence. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> it's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to move on, if I may, to ground two, please. Again, if you just give me one moment to... <clears throat> Pause for breath. Round two is the, uh, or issue two, is the waiver point, the waiver or estoppel point. Um, the argument is set out in our skeleton argument at page 
1, 1, 2, 3, 2 onwards, starting at paragraph 29. Um, uh, we say that the judge's ruling uh, at paragraphs 81 to 83, that there was no binding agreement because the account opening fee was not paid before the transaction proceeded on the 3rd of February was wrong. We say that whether or not this court accepts that the judge fell into an error on one point on the facts or not. Uh, the point on the facts where we say the judge fell into error was that at the discussion before they went into the room to do the transaction on the 3rd of February, there was a discussion between Mr. Al-Ali and Mr. Ahmadi about the payment of the AOB. The judge accepted that Mr. Al-Ali had said that the transaction fee would be paid out of the proceeds of the transaction, not paid up front. Previously, Mr. Ahmadi had been insistent that it must be paid up front before Huobi could become a client and the transaction could proceed. And by way of background, although Mr. Turner in the previous days had agreed that the fee could be paid out of the proceeds of the transaction, the judge held that he did not have the authority to reach that agreement. So the position legally was still outstanding when that discussion before the meeting took place. The judge found that Mr. Al-Ali said, we'll pay it out of the proceeds, uh, and that's because there was no going to be no time to pay it ahead. And that Mr. Ahmadi uh, heard, understood, but said nothing back. So he was silent at that point. However, he permitted the transaction to go ahead because, to his knowledge, everybody went into the room. What happened in the room then happened, including the agreement as to what commission D1 should get, communicated by the email I showed you earlier, including uh, Tabarak through Mr. Turner, uh, playing the part that had been contemplated in the deal structure emails by seeking to take control of the Bitcoin in the wallet and also being ready to receive the money that was going to be paid into their client account. Uh, and I'm breaking, the, breaking that down, yes. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have... I have some difficulty reconciling the finding at paragraph 85 with the finding that there was no contract. Um, if there was no, uh, if there was no contract, how how could there have been an agreement as to the consideration for the contract? That, that, there seems to me to be an inconsistency there. I, I, I throw that out because you're not the ones going to answer that. You've got to say, yes, 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 that's a very good point. Uh, but Mr. Hill is going to have to think about that point. The, the, the contractual analysis that I suggest, which I think the judge is, is adopting here, okay. is that there was a concluded agreement, but it was subject to a condition precedent. Yes, but how is that? But that well, then... And it was that condition precedent that was waived... The judge recognised the potential for waiver because this whole section is about um, how um, uh, uh, whether or not there was a waiver. Um, could you just remind me of the paragraph number? Yes, I'm looking at paragraphs 84 and 85. So at 84, he says, as to the contention that the agreement uh, also never incepted because of due diligence, he finds that there was a waiver in relation to that. Then he goes on at 85. Although it's not strictly necessary to do so, um, I think it appropriate to say that I find that the fees and commission due to Tabarak for their role in the transaction were agreed 
sometimes before the 300 Bitcoin were transferred to Mr. Morozov's Trezor wallet. Now, I, I find it hard to reconcile the fact that there was an agreement as to the remuneration for the um, uh, transfer uh, or acting as intermediary and a finding that there was no contract. I mean, yeah, well, we, we agree with that overall observation. Yes, well, I thought you, I thought you would. I, how, I said, how, I'd, throw it how, out. I'd throw it out for Mr. Yeah. Hill. How, how it works is that yeah. when the judge is saying, I think it's appropriate to say that I find that the fees and commission were agreed, we actually know that the AO fee had already been agreed in terms of its amount. It was 25,000 US dollars plus that. Okay, so that had already been agreed. What hadn't been agreed was the commission, which is the, uh, in percentage terms... 3%, something like that. I'm sorry, I don't have a figure on my mind. Yes, it's there in the uh, actual text so, of, so of it's the, in the, it's uh, in the paragraph. Yeah, yes, exactly. So it is, thank you. Um, the total fee was 3.5%. That's the commission. So so the way the contract was supposed to work, we, we su suggest, uh, Justice Black, is this. Um, under the terms of the AOA, they had to pay the £25,000 up front before anything more could happen. Dollars. Dollars. <laughs> Never mind. About the same. Not the yeah, same. About, about the same. Dollars. No. Um, um, they had to pay that up front. That was a condition precedent to the contract then being capable of ongoing performance. It doesn't mean there's absolutely no contract at all. It's a contract subject to, to a, it's indeed a binding contract subject to a condition precedent as to its inf subsequent enforcement performance. Okay, that's the first stage. The second stage is uh, that under the AOA, it was contemplated that specific fees for specific transactions would be agreed and that they would be put into a written addendum. The, the, the specific fee in this case is the commission uh, of uh, uh, for, for, for D1, and that didn't have to be agreed as a condition precedent. It had to be agreed at some point, and it was at some point, after the parties had started to perform the contract. And that only works contractually if the AO fee condition precedent has been waived. So uh, the, uh, the, the waiver through the conduct of the parties, through the conduct of D1, the combined conversation at the beginning with Mr. Ahmadi, their actions in the room, and uh, Mr. Ahmadi's, uh, at the very, this is an important factual point that the judge didn't refer to in this part of his judgment, the Trezor wallet coming back to Mr. Ahmadi's room and going into and accepted by him and put into his safe. That is all conduct that is relevant to, is capable of being taken into account in terms of whether there was a waiver by estoppel. And it's as simple as that. Um, any other approach to it makes a nonsense of what happened in the room and a nonsense of uh, the first sentence of paragraph <coughs> Um, and, 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 and that is the factual analysis that we say you can get without any um, challenge to a positive finding of fact made by the judge. In other words, we, we adopt for this part of our position his finding that Mr. Ahmadi was silent. Um, everybody else's evidence was that he actually agreed. Um, and... We do say that the judge is finding that he was silent, contrary to the evidence of Mr. Turner, Mr. Al-Ali, when virtually all of the rest of Mr. Ahmadi's evidence had been dismissed by the judge, uh, was, uh, was a, 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 a strange finding. Uh, nonetheless, that was his finding. We do appeal it, but we don't need to succeed on that appeal, on that particular fact because of all of the other conduct that uh, took place 
which is capable of, uh, and we say did, constitute a waiver by a stop of that term. Um, uh, as far as the legal test is concerned, um, uh, we deal with that in our skeleton argument uh, at paragraphs 32 to uh, 34. Um, the way the judge approached it uh, was in paragraph 82 to say, this is at page 9474, bottom of the page, Mr. Ahmadi's failure to respond to Mr. Al Ali and letting the transaction proceed would not have led an objective observer in the position of Mr. Al Ali and Mr. Saxena clearly and unequivocally to conclude that on behalf of Tabarak he was waiving the AO condition precedent. So he is finding that Mr. Al Ali let the transaction proceed, but he does not find himself persuaded that that was conduct uh, taken together with all of the other conduct that was therefore authorised by him and which happened subsequently uh, 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 amounts to a waiver. Um, that test, the objective observer uh, test, it means that the judge is looking at what happened objectively, which must be correct. Uh, he's looking to see what the uh, effect objectively on those uh, on the side of Huwobi who um, observed the, the overall conduct that I have referred to um, would have clearly and unequivocally concluded. Uh, we say applying that test uh, that there's only one answer that Properly, one could conclude. Uh, certainly, Mr. Al Ali and Mr. Saxena did, in fact, believe that the AO fee condition precedent had been waived by Mr. Ahmadi's conduct. The only question is whether they reasonably believed that, and clearly, we would submit that on the basis of the facts as such, nothing negative or contrary, but being allowed to go ahead when they hadn't paid the fee uh, uh, means that that reliance, if you like, was reasonable. Um, do, you, um, uh, do, you challenge, do you challenge the finding uh, that um, uh, Mr. Turner didn't have authority to waive? No. No. Thank you. He had authority to do everything else. It but. was just it was just that one thing that the judge said he didn't, and we don't challenge that on this appeal. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and it's also uh, entirely apposite to point out that Mr. Turner, in cross examination, um, certainly understood uh, Mr. Ahmadi to have agreed, and certainly. Uh, proceeded on the basis that the condition precedent fee had been uh, waived, and if he too uh, relied on uh, uh, Mr. Ahmadi's conduct, that is further evidence in support of the reasonableness of the reliance, if you like, of the Huobi personnel. Uh, and um, that is the factual basis for saying that the test applied by the judge is um, correct. At paragraph 32 in our skeleton on 11234, we um, set out what I regret we mistakenly called Article 30, but it's actually Article 31. A contract in writing which contains a clause, uh, this is page 11234, uh, if you wish to look at it in, in front of you. Article 31 provides a contract in writing which contains a clause requiring any modification or termination by agreement to be in writing may not be otherwise modified or terminated. However, a party may be precluded by its conduct from asserting such clause to the extent that the other party has acted in reliance on that conduct. 
Now, Article 31 is obviously dealing specifically with a um, uh, uh, written modification only clause. But it is accepting that such a clause can be uh, effectively waived by conduct uh, if the other party has acted in reliance on that conduct. And so therefore, in Article 31, in the specific context of a written only modification clause, uh, there, the law is recognising a concept that we would recognise as waiver or estoppel, waiver by estoppel, uh, and the elements of it are conduct uh, and reliance. Uh, the test that the learned judge applied is not put in quite that way, but is in realistic terms, um, we would submit, much the same. Uh, as far as the uh, broader law is concerned on waiver by estoppel, uh, you can see in paragraph 34 of our skeleton argument at 11234, uh, what we say about that, uh, I commend to you and we'll just flag it up for you um, now. Uh, the relevant part of the text, Law of Estoppel, um, by Michael Barnes, QC as he then was, um, a work which received express commendation uh, from Lord Burroughs uh, in the Estoppel by Convention case, Tinkler. Um, uh, he referred particularly in that case to Chapter 5, because Chapter 5 is the chapter that deals with estoppel by convention. But clearly this is a, 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 a helpful and authoritative work. Uh, and uh, he deals in Chapter 6 with uh, what he calls promissory estoppel, but it's the same thing as we have here. Uh, uh, and you will see at uh, page 1, 4, Two four one four two two four sorry one four two two four paragraph six point two four I rely on that as a summary of the essential elements of the estoppel with which we are here concerned. Um, you will see his citation of Robert Goff. J, Mr. Justice Robert Goff, as he then was in BP against Hunt, famous case, uh, and the doctrine requires one, a legal rep relationship between the parties, two, a representation expressed or implied by one party that he will not enforce his strict rights against the other, and three, reliance by the representee. Uh, although uh, those wording that that wording is not repeated verbatim or even completely in Article 31. The essence of Article 31 is this, we would say. Uh, and, and if you also uh, go to um, page uh, 14226, paragraph 6.114, inferred promises the necessary, clear, and unequivocal promise may be inferred from the conduct of the parties. Uh, we say that this isn't a case simply about whether or not you can have a representation by silence. Mr. Ahmadi's silence in the context in which it occurred in non-response to a direct statement about what was going to happen, and then more broadly by what happened thereafter, is a is a conduct case, not a silence case, um, and uh, that is uh, confirmed by paragraph 6.114. Uh, if uh, you wish to consider his consideration of silence, uh, specifically it starts at 6.125 6 on page 14228.
but as I say, this is a conduct case. Um, uh, and uh, the entire uh, chapter is summarized helpfully uh, uh, in the paragraphs that you have uh, in this uh, extract, starting at 14232. And I do not think that I need to refer you to any more law uh, on ground two. Well, broadly, I, as I say, I, I stand by what is stated in our skeleton under this ground for greater detail, particularly in relation to the relevant evidence. Uh, yes, it's 20 past three. Just, yeah. Chief Justice, yeah, you yeah, said an hour and a half. Break. Actually, I've come to the end of round two. I'm about to start round three. Yeah, can, can, can we take a short break? Can we take five minutes now? Yeah, sure. I'll okay. do with a, a moment's break myself. Got it, Jim. Thank you. Otherwise. <coughs>
I don't know. I'm not sure. Turning to gram three, which is the uh, gram that uh, deals with the uh, contract, assuming that there has been waiver or estoppel in relation to the AO uh, uh, fee. And it's notable that the judge held that there was a, 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 a contract. The only thing that stops it. Uh, being performed in his eyes was the fact that the condition precedent had not been uh, complied with. Assuming that was waived, there was a contract. And in very broad terms, the findings that the judge made about the role that Tabarak agreed to undertake under that contract support our contractual claim. And are sufficient for us to succeed on our contractual plan properly uh, when that role, as found by the judge, is properly analysed. Uh, the question of who proposed the modalities is irrelevant as a contract because D1 Tabarak had agreed to undertake the role. Uh, the question of whether they had any duty to advise is irrelevant because they'd agreed to undertake the role pursuant to the contract the judge found. So we're very much on 
the same page as the judge at this stage. Uh, and just to show where the departure starts to appear, I want to take you to paragraph 104 of the judgment, uh, page 9485, in the bundle. Now, I recognise that this is, these are findings of fact under the heading of negligence, but very pithily in paragraph 104, starting at line 7, with the word rather, the judge is finding what it was that Mr. Turner agreed, uh, what, what, and indeed what Tabarak agreed to do, to carry out the relatively simple task of, one, using Tabarak's wallet to receive the 300 Bitcoin from Huobi, and to transfer them to Navicon once the price had been received, and two, opening an account for Huobi. What he was obliged to do if only the agreement had been binding and enforceable, was to operate Tabarak's own wallet to receive the 300 Bitcoin and to transfer them to Navicon once the purchase money had been received and in an account maintained by Tabarak and then to transfer the net proceeds back to Huobi. Now, so far, uh, subject to one point I'll come to in a moment about what Tabarak's wallet means, uh, that is a, a, a fair description of the basic role that uh, it was agreed they would perform. The only bit missing, but which can't be disputed, and indeed on a factual basis was accepted by Mr. Turner in his cross-examination of the passage I took to you to earlier, was to add to one, two, and three uh, the following to return the Bitcoin to Huobi in the event that the purchase monies were not received into the Tabarak client account as had been intended. If you add that, you have the essential description of the role as found by the judge. And we say that's sufficient. The point about the Tabarak's wallet is where we start to depart from the judge uh, because um, his view was that because of the game changer that took place uh, in the meeting on the 3rd of February and the fact that there was uh, a non, as he would put it, Tabarak wallet proposed and used <coughs> meant that the agreement that he found would have been oper operation, operating on D1 during that meeting if there'd been a waiver, didn't apply because there'd been a change in approach. There are two answers to that, we say, and that's where the judge in that bit of analysis is wrong. First of all, the agreement to use a Tabarak wallet isn't specific to a wallet that Tabarak bring into the meeting. It's any wallet that qualifies as a, a device that can undertake the task, which Tabarak take control of physically, and beyond that, take control of its function through setting it up as indeed they did. So either it's simply, uh, in fact, the same contract, because you should construe Tabarak wallet in the uh, deal structure emails in the way I've just described, or the second answer to this is that there was a variation in the meeting by agreement to use a different wallet. Either way, it's the wallet that has to be used, they agree to use it, and the same responsibilities on D1 continue to operate as set out in 104 by the judge. Um, yeah, it's any wallet that is set up so as to give Tabarak exclusive control over the Bitcoin 
That's what's being referred to in the dim structure emails. Uh, and the wallet that was actually used falls within that. But as I say, the other way of looking at it is a variation of the agreement um, uh, in the room, uh, which is sufficient for our purposes as well. Um, and then for what it's worth, uh, it means that we say the judge at 105 is wrong to say it follows that this is not a case where the relationship was akin to contract. Um, it, 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 it was akin to contract for the reason I've identified, and the judge is incorrect to say that. Um, uh, but that's something I will develop further when we come to deal with the talk part of the case. Uh, uh, perhaps a little bit later this afternoon. You say it was a contract, not simply akin to it. Yes, but uh, if, 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 if contrary it, to ground two... It, but I, I can't it, see, if, I can't see um, how... You get to a kit, either it's a contract or it isn't. Well, I mean, it's not something like failure of consideration, because clearly there, the, the, there were going to be fees paid. So the, I can't see a vitiating, um, a, a vitiating cause for their saying that there would be a contract but for that vitiation, unless, unless you're arguing that the failure to satisfy the um, uh, condition precedent may qualify. But I'm not sure that does qualify in quite no, the I'm same way sure as a I failure. Either. I, 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 of course, the other difference under DIFC contract law is that there was no consideration in any event. So yeah. it, 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 that, that possible reason for a contractual situation yes. turning into a tortious situation is absent here. Yes. Unlike in the English case. Well, quite. I, I was thinking about the English cases. Is critical. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, ha it, tu it turns up more often as a yes. result. But anyway, you, you have my point, I think. Yes. Um, so uh, the. Um, the ground with that introduction uh, is dealt with in our skeleton argument, uh, which starts at 11238 um, uh, from paragraph 39 through uh, to yes, uh, 51. And again, as with previous uh, grounds, I take that as red, and I'm not going to. Uh, uh, go through it blow by blow. Um, I, I also rely on um, and ask the court to take into account the analysis of the contract that appeared in, in the closing submissions prepared by Bernardo Jr. Uh, at the trial, uh, and you'll find the relevant section. Um, uh, at, at starting at paragraph 184, reference uh, 8829 in the bundle, page 8829. Uh, and there is uh, much uh, helpful analysis in there on which I rely. Um, in summary, the key issue, uh, relying on the basic structure of the role which we say D1 agreed to undertake, and as summarised in paragraph uh, 104 of the judgment, which we just looked at, um, we say, uh, as we um, uh, do in paragraph 44 of our skeleton at 11239, having first uh, recited a passage from the Law Commission's consultation paper that we looked at earlier, um, we say at paragraph 44 that it's plain uh, that all of the following involve Tabarak undertaking an escrow agency role and in so doing a custodial role, using those terms in the way that we've now shown are conventional and acceptable in this uh, field of business, the digital assets. Um, uh, and uh, we rely on the points that are set out there under the sub-paragraphs that go over to 11240 and 11241. And I add the point that I've just made. We rely on the factual findings of the judge set out in 104 of his judgment. And at 45, uh, we say that um, 
Tabarak's role was simply to ensure that the purpose, and the learned friend doesn't like the, the, the use of a word that we give a capital letter to and define because it's a construct, he says, but it's a clear way of uh, identifying what the purpose of the role that uh, Tabarak in fact uh, had uh, is. Uh, namely, that the Bitcoin would not be transferred to the bar until payment was received. Uh, and and uh, we, uh, I, I, I highlight, because I want to highlight it in order to make it clear that it's not essential to our contractual analysis, the final sentence of 45. We say that necessarily involved Tabarak devising and implementing a process that met the objective. We, as you know, our case is on the facts that they did do those things. But it doesn't matter if they did it, if, as a bank uh, uh, willing to undertake the custodial role, they agreed to undertake it uh, and to use a wallet to get exclusive control of our, uh, of our Bitcoin. Uh, I would not wish it to be said that without... Uh, a positive finding of fact that Tabarak did devise the process, uh, our contractual claim would fail. It would not at all. They certainly had to implement the process um, that they'd agreed to undertake, and of course they didn't, because they uh, allowed the six mnemonic words uh, that were, if you like, our words, to be revealed, and as a result, they were unable to comply with their contractual obligation to return the Bitcoin to us if the funds were not received uh, from the buyer. Um, uh, we say at 48 that uh, the judge was wrong to apply labels that did not describe the role that Tabrat was in fact undertaking. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that in particular, but certainly his criticism of our use of the phrase custody or custodial services and that of our witnesses as grandiose and the implication being something of a construct is uh, in retrospect, now that we've seen the, the, the material that's been published by the Law Commission, inaccurate. Um, so... Uh, Paragraph 50 is key to our claim for contract. <coughs> um, applying the correct concept, namely that of control, to the judge's findings at J60, and I would add J104. Um, oh, I have added it there. <laughs> I'm sorry. It wasn't in the earlier paragraph. Um, it follows that he ought to have found that a binding agreement between Corobi and Tabrak was made, which included the terms listed below, and that Tabrak was breach the terms of that contract. Uh, and you can see, I don't need to read it out, what the key terms are. They would provide an address to which we could send uh, the, uh, effectively send the key which would enable um, D1, Tabarak, to have control of the Bitcoin using the wallet. Um, they did that. Uh, and you can see uh, the reference there uh, to the evidence for that. I don't think that I took you to what was 9428, but I think that will be the same page number in bundle in the bundle 428 uh, if you want to look at it. Can you just check that for me, Justine, please? So, We'll get you the uh, page reference for, for, for that uh, particular WhatsApp message, um, uh, and, and, and I'll let you have it. Um, then at B, Tabarak would only transfer the Bitcoin, or allow the Bitcoin to be transferred to the buyer once the purchase money had been paid. If it were paid, uh, they would transfer the Bitcoin to the buyer and transfer the net proceeds to an account 
nominated by Tabarak. That's on behalf of Groby. If the purchase money was not received, Tabarak would transfer the BTC back to Groby. So that's the bit that I said needed to be added to the judge's finding at um, 104. Um, and applying those terms, that didn't happen. Uh, there was a term for consideration at little e. Uh, we've been through that, and we say that it follows that there was a breach of that contract uh, at 51. And that is the contractual analysis. May I have just one moment, please, Chief Justice? Oh, yeah. Okay. I I'm reminded with gratitude on my part that at paragraph 60 of the judgment, um, the uh, judge himself uh, added, uh, this is at page 9467, my little four, that I said should be added to 104. So at the bottom of page 9467, paragraph 64, if the purchase money was not received, Tabarak would transfer the BTC back to Huobi. So that's the judge's contractual analysis that that term was breached. <coughs> the only reason we submit that we didn't succeed at trial on the contract claim is because the judge held, uh, firstly, that there was a no waiver of the AO, and because he incorrectly held, although he didn't, in fact, because of the waiver decision, have to really analyse this, he incorrectly held that the contract he sets out at Judgment paragraph 60 wouldn't have applied to what actually happened on the day for the Tabarak wallet reason. That's the contractual analysis. It's straightforward. Did, uh, did you want page 9427, did you say? Before, page 1729, if that was the one you wanted. 9428, which is the, the document. Uh, with the Bitcoin address in it, that reference... That's 1730, old. yes, I found that. That's an old reference. And 17... 1730. Thank you for helping me. Yes. Yeah, that wasn't a document I showed you at the beginning. Um, it's a good example of the performance of the contract going on it, uh, in the room, from the room, after the parties had gone there following the discussion with Mr. Ahmadi. Uh, and it's a WhatsApp out from Christian Turner to the group. And just so, if, in case you haven't picked it up, in relation to these WhatsApp uh, messages, they set up a group, Turner, Al Ali, Saxena, the relevant people, so that they could keep in touch electronically throughout the transaction. The mere setting up of the WhatsApp group demonstrates, or the operation of the WhatsApp group, I can't remember exactly when it was set up, but the operation of it on the day is another element of conduct that uh, uh, fits with our, um, our, our analysis. These are the what appears on paragraph one four seven, is it? So one seven three zero in the bundle uh, is is uh, the well, those are the prices. Oh, I see. When you know, when you go to, you, you, what you're looking at is the request by Turner for the um, uh, the Bitcoin address so that that can be sent to the wallet. And then Shushant Huobi sends, I think, the address. Yeah, uh, in the middle of 1730, there's a box with a photograph mm. with, a, with a QR code on it. Yes. You see that? Yes. And that is that is a screenshot, which is being sent by Christian Turner to the group. I think. And that's the and, new address and, of the and wallet. And it says, "Send the Bitcoin to this new wallet address." And that's the that's the Trezor. That's address. the Trezor, uh, originally provided by the buyers, but now set up by Mr. Turner. 
and he's generated that address, and he said, now you can send your Bitcoin to our, 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 our to this address. And the address is, what is that, Shushan, Shushan Hobi? Is that the address? No, no. Uh, that's another piece of technical information. That's being sent by someone on the Huobi side. That is the, I, I'm told that's the web, that, that's the blockchain code for the Bitcoin. Yeah. For the address. Yeah. The address is the one that appears in the screenshot. Yeah, that's You're the, referring that is to the address that they're being invited to send the payment. Bitcoin to. Bitcoin to be sent to. But it says receive Bitcoin BTC. Then what does it say there? Something like address. What address? Branch yeah, address. And then Branch there, address. If you can't really see the, the lettering, but that, that is a very complicated code, yes. which is the address... Yes. To which the um, uh, public key to the Bitcoin is going to be sent in order for it to be under the control yes. of the uh, of the defendant. Okay. Now I thought what Shushan Tuobi is sending it says in the WhatsApp is actually the uh, the public key that is sent to the wallet. Yeah, but safe. to the address. That of Mr. The Turner has yes. previously provided. Yeah. So the, well, we, I think we're using address wrongly there. I'm so sure, I'm sure we are. No, when he says this is the wallet, uh, send Bitcoin to this new wallet address. I think what he's asking for is Shushant to send the um, <coughs> public key of the first tranche of the Bitcoin uh, of the Bitcoin to that wallet. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and then he so so you so they send the first hundred coins through, yeah. and then uh, Morozov confirms that that it's received, and then um, well, Mr. And Turner confirms it's agreed, and, and that Mr. Morozov has yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the, the 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 second tranche go through. I think as we see, yeah. there sorry as well, don't, sorry don't forget there are two. Uh, Justice Black, there are two processes going on here. Yes. One is the address to which the Bitcoin effectively has got to be sent, the public key has got to be sent. Yes. The other thing that's going on in the room is the price that's going to be paid. Yes. Oh, yes. And so the message from Shantu Saxena underneath the long public key uh, is... The price that was paid for the, the that price tranche that's been agreed in the room, and it had to be done at the last minute because it depended on how things were moving in the markets. And one of the personnel who was there on behalf of uh, Huobi, Mr. Uh, Nab Nabag, Nahag, thank you, he was their expert on hedging and pricing and so on. So he, he would have uh, assisted them in agreeing what the actual price at that moment should be. And where it says, OK, confirmed by Evgeny Morozov, I think that's the first... I yes. think that's a reference to the price for the first tranche. Okay. But, but, what, but just, I, just so we're all clear, so what we're seeing is the public key for 100 bitcoins being sent to the wallet. Yes. Yes, I mean, that, yes. if that's helpful to yes. my it, it, it is, thank you. And I, I asked the question, what earth is going on here if uh, the first defendant wasn't performing the role contemplated by the contract that the judge found existed. Um, it clearly was. Um, and, 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 and therefore the, the liability must flow from that. Um, and that is what I propose to say, unless you have any further questions, on ground three, contract. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Smith. Yes, yes, of course, to... Chief Justice. This screenshot was sent by Sir Christian Turner yes. to the group. Yes. To the group. And then Christian say F. Turner says send BTC to this new wallet address. Yes. And the next line is three B B da 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 from Shushan OB. Yes. Is that the same address that no. appeared? No, no. What what's happening 
is if you see the screenshot. Yes. The screenshot is um, ha is the location. Forget the word address for the moment. Okay. Is the it's, it tells you how to send yes. the um, public key for the Bitcoin to that wallet. Oh. So so what so when you've got that QR code, then you know where all of that text, which is the which is the uh, public key for the Bitcoin, is to be sent. Yes. So once you've got the public key within the wallet, when you put a private key within the wallet, then you can deal with the Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. So the the, the number at the uh, Sushan Hobi's uh, reference there has got nothing to do with our case. Oh yes. No, it's it it has. It's a bit. It's the Bitcoin. It, it's it, then no, I'm talking about the three G B B B. Yes, that's the that's the that's the that's the public key ah, of the relevant the of the relevant bit the yeah. first tranche of the relevant Bitcoin. The so sending that public key to the address identified by Mr. Turner effectively uh, okay. amounts okay, to the it. transfer of the Bitcoin. Okay. As yeah. Justice Black rightly okay. pointed out, right. it's not I'm sorry. it's actually only the key that's mm. transferred and therefore control of it. But that is that's what's happening there. Okay. Okay, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm now going to uh, take slightly out of order, if I may, um, the next uh, two or three grounds and go and, and what I propose to do with your permission uh, in a few minutes is to make us, I've made quite good progress, better than expected. And so I'm not going to be pressing the court to go on until five o'clock. Um, thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity, but I'm going to make a start on ground six, which is the negligence claim. Um, and, uh, and then uh, whether or not I complete it, it doesn't matter in terms of uh, our progress, I don't think. Uh, and I, will, I want to make a start on it and then uh, if necessary, come back to it to complete in the morning. Um, before I do that, can I just pick up on one point that Justice Black made this morning, uh, which I was thinking about over lunch, and I just want, thought I should say something about it in case there's any misunderstanding. I think you uh, at one point described potentially uh, the uh, capacity or role of the first defendant as a gratuitous bailee. It was, what I was thinking about was if there's no contract, if it's holding the physical key, on what basis would it hold the physical key if well, there's no contract? The, the, he can hold the physical treasure, treasure wallet. Yeah. Sorry, physical a, wallet. I mean, as a tangible piece of property, as yes. a baby, but he can't hold the, They can't hold the bitcoin because the bitcoin is not tangible property, and bail, bailment only applies to tangible property. That is clear under English law, and I think that's the position under DIFC law as well. There's been a whole debate in the Law Commission about yes. whether or not the concept of bailment under English law mm. should be extended to this new intermediate type of property, uh, digital assets. Mm. It would be an extension because bailment, centuries old, has mm. a concept, uh, applies to the possession physical possession of a tangible property, and Bitcoin is not such. So you would have to extend, and in fact the recommendation of the Law Commission is not to do so, because they consider that uh, the remedies that are available in contract, a trust in particular, are sufficient at, at the moment for, for, for that not to be necessary. But they were talking, what was exercising me slightly was this, that I understand that entirely when you're dealing with the Bitcoin itself. Because yes. that's just computer code that sits on the blockchain. But if you're dealing with a cold wallet, yes. which is a physical piece of property, mm. which actually controls the Bitcoin, yes. so and I'm just thinking out loud, and we're all, we're all, we're all, of course, in, in uncharted territory. 
Um, if you're the Bailey of the physical item that has um, rivalrous control of the Bitcoin, <coughs> does that mean you're a Bailey of the Bitcoin as well? Hmm. Yeah. You think it should not be, but I pose a simple wow. like this, but I, what same thing was passing through my mind. Because that 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 That's wallet. Supreme Court question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid we're the final court from Bill. Yeah. Well, no, I know, but it's the sort maybe of question that one might have received from. Maybe one laws. has to extend extend yeah. that, unlike the English courts or English, uh, we want we want to extend that to that, because that bit that wallet can only hold that Bitcoin, or the Bitcoin has to be held through a wallet. It cannot be physically be held. It can't. But, Chief Justice, um, and this is the reason why, under the new DIFC laws, which assuming they come into force soon, um, uh, will provide, there is no uh, bailment option in the new laws for digital assets, because the, um, the approach has been, rather like the law commissions, that you can protect the owner or the the original owner of the Bitcoin um, Why haven't through you contract and through um, trust, which are flexible and appropriate remedies, mm. whereas bailment is quite an old and particularly, um, uh, I'm not going to say rigid, but it's a particular mm. approach. And it would, without doubt, require a significant extension of the common law, potentially by statute, not judicial lawmaking in England, to achieve that end, and the recommendation is that it doesn't need to be done, and it hasn't been proposed in new laws in the DIFC either. And I'm certainly not asking this court <laughs> to uh, 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 indulge in I think in your any, junior in, wanted in to that. say something. But my 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 <laughs> Justice Black does raise, and I'll, I'll allow it to speak in a moment if I may. But he does raise an interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer to that on, on my feet as I stand here, uh, and I'll give it some thought because it may be of interest, but we don't need it, I don't think. Just very quickly, one of the um, academic articles by the EU that's in the authorities bundle does deal specifically with the issue as to whether possessory um, cause of action should apply to digital assets, the conclusion being that they've evolved in the tangible world completely different normative um, issues to be dealt with. I'll, overnight, I'll find the relevant page and, and um, I see. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure whether him... I, I, w I would thought that you're going to persuade question. us to extend <laughs> the, the law to, to, to... unless that's against you, the, the, the to, to bitcoins. You, you are not invited in this case to yeah, extend or change the IFC law, but you are asked to clarify what it means in breach of confidence. Um, I think that is clear. Um, and uh, Okay, Let, let's take another example. The bank we were discussing during the break. The bank. The bank doesn't hold the cash. Are they bailers? The money, your money in the bank? Is it, are you, are they bailers of that no, cash? It's, a, it's intangible property. Intangible? Yeah. But are they, are, you they're are saying they're not bailers? They're, they're not bailers? They're, they're not bailers? Bailey. No, they're not a bailey. They're, they're, they're a creditor. The, the relationship is, is a contractual. Precious, precious, precious. Sorry. They're a debt. They're, they're a debtor. They're a debtor. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a, a bank. That's a contractual but, but relationship. But if, if I give you not cash, I say, Mr. Spink, can you sort of hold this money in my account, you manage it for me, you become the trustee, right? Yes. Trustee, but you are still not a bailey, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it depends what, what happens to the cash when you hand it over to me. If you say, here's some cash, stick it in your own bank account, mm, that's and, a, that's uh, a different and mix it up, and just remember that you owe me mm. 200 pounds, mm. Mr. Speak. That's a debt that I owe you, it's not a trust relationship. Okay. If on the other hand, uh, you give me um, if your bar, bar, please hold or your this pen, for me. Or yeah. your gold bar, mm. and you say that is my gold bar, mm. and I, I will want it back, mm. or at least you hold it for me mm. to my order. That will that will be that might well be a bear trust. Yes. 
Um, and, and sitting in the background of all of this, mm. not dependent necessarily on a specific trust relationship, is the concept of the fiduciary, which we'll come on to tomorrow okay. to the extent we need to. Fiduciary uh, relationships occur where um, uh, there's a relationship of trust between the two sides and can impose particular duties that wouldn't otherwise apply in a non-fiduciary relationship. Uh, we say that in this case, in fact, uh, D1 is a fiduciary, but the extent to which it adds, even if that's right, to the remedies is something that we'll need to consider a little bit tomorrow. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Um, uh, can I uh, make a brief start on uh, ground six, negligence? Um, this is to be found in our... Uh, skeleton argument at um, starting at page 11252 in the bundle, paragraph 70 to 79. <coughs> I, uh, and uh, we rely on everything that's set out there. Um, I'm going to just step back and try and um, uh, set the scene for you um, a little bit. Uh, in terms of the law dealt with in our skeleton argument and alluded to by the judge, the two cases in particular that are dealt with in our skeleton argument and by the judge are the <coughs> Manchester Building Society case mentioned in paragraph 76 on 11 on 11256 and multiplex in paragraph 78 on 11257. Um, uh, interesting and important though those cases are, uh, there is more recent and authoritative authority um, on the assumption of responsibility as a basis for uh, duty of care in tort, which um, I will uh, take you to uh, to the extent necessary probably tomorrow morning, but just to flag it up for you overnight. Uh, it is the um, uh, uh, JP SPC4 against Royal Bank of Scotland International case, uh, which is a uh, a case in which Lords Hamlin and Burroughs, which is a pretty powerful combination, wrote a joint judgment, uh, and which gives you most of the answers that you need to know to the question of uh, how a voluntary assumption of responsibility uh, arises in cases of a wide variety of nature, including, we say, this case. And it renders somewhat, um, we say, otios, frankly, the debate between us and the learned judge about whether and this is alluded to in paragraph 76 of our skeleton, about whether Manchester Building Society is applicable at all. That was a professional negligence case and was a case in which um, they were, the Supreme Court was in the territory of um, Bank Bruxelles and other such cases where it was a question of whether the loss sustained fell within the scope of the duty. It was principally about scope although it tells us much about uh, assumption of responsibility, but to some extent, whether or not you say Manchester Building Society applies to this scenario at all, the judge said it didn't, because Tabarak were not professional advisors, uh, we say it does in fact apply, that's somewhat um, irrelevant now given the uh, uh, subsequent uh, Supreme Court decision, the Royal Bank of Scotland case to which I've just referred and which I've flagged up. Um, so, uh, by way of introduction then to this ground, our positive case is that, uh, first of all, by taking on the role of the independent third party who would have exclusive control, uh, brackets for the protection of the interests of both buyer and seller of A, money in a client account paid by the buyer for the Bitcoin, and B, the Bitcoin 
control of which through the transfer of the public key passed from Huobi, the claimants, into the control of the first defendant. Uh, as a result of which the first defendant would be able to control any transfer to the buyer of the Bitcoin or transfer it back to Huobi if the price was not received. Um, through that assumption of a role, as described by me just there, D1 was assuming responsibility for the security of the Bitcoin and indeed these money, the buyer's money, which included properly setting up the wallet into which it was the public key was going to be transferred, so as to ensure that once set up and once public key for the Bitcoin was transferred, it couldn't be removed by anyone else. If they got the setup wrong, the whole purpose of the arrangement would break down. So you can't you can't divorce the setting up from the subsequent holding control of D1. It's a necessary prior step to ensure that they are able to comply in a contractual case with their contractual obligation to look after the Bitcoin and return it if no money was paid, or the responsibility in talk that they assume to do likewise. It's instructive uh, to look at the reasons at trial while why the first defendant denied any duty of care. Uh, and these are set out in our closing, my learned junior's closing submissions uh, at the trial at paragraph 206. You don't need to look at them, uh, but the reference is page 8839. But it's very instructive to see the case that the first defendant was running at trial, which the judge had to deal with and dealt with almost entirely in our favour. It's only at the very end that he, we say, fell into any error. Uh, at the end of a very, very difficult case for any judge, uh, given the voluminous amount of material with which he was presented and the amount of evidence with which he had to contend, um, uh, one has some sympathy for the judge, albeit that we have to say that he did, in the end, fall into error. But the, uh, the, the, the reasons for denying a duty were, first of all, the first defendant was only providing a neutral venue, a room, as though they were acting as a drop-in provider of office space. Well, that's clearly nonsense on the facts, uh, and uh, was found to be so by the judge. Secondly, the first defendant didn't advise the claimants to proceed with the transaction or as to the mechanism. Well, that's more controversial, as we know, on the findings found by the judge. But the judge did find that assurances were given, slightly different from the assurances that we uh, are seeing, <coughs> but nonetheless substantial assurances, which clearly did reassure us on the day. Uh, most importantly, the third point is that the first defendant said that it did not assume any risk or duty of care and or liability in relation to the transaction. It was a private transaction between the claimant and the buyer. And the first defendant did not provide any advice or assume any duty of care. Well, putting aside the advice point, the, uh, the, the idea that they didn't assume any risk is, we say again, obviously nonsense, given that they were undertaking, albeit the judge said it was a relatively simple task, they were taking, undertaking a crucial task. They were assuming a risk because they were accepting that they would look after the Bitcoin and the money and return them to their right previous owners if the deal didn't go through. Um, they also allege contributory negligence, um, which it wasn't necessary to deal with at the trial for obvious reasons. Um, the, uh, the, the next question is what the correct legal test is of DIFC law. Um, and if we can take this from the judgment, I think, most easily. I'm sorry. Uh, can you help me with Article 18? Yes.
Yes, uh, um, uh, paragraph 98 of the judgment at 9481 sets out articles 17, 18 and 21. The key article, or so the judge thought, uh, on the, and this is on the basis of the cases that was presented to him, was 18. Uh, and this is you know, familiar territory, I'm sure, uh, for the courts, but uh, a duty of care is owed where it's reasonably foreseeable that the acts or omissions would cause, could cause loss. There is a sufficient relationship of proximity, and it's fair, just, and reasonable. Now, that's the so-called old tripartite uh, test to the uh, establishment for duty of care, Hedley, Byrne, and Heller, uh, Caparo, Dixon, and so Dickman, and so on. Um, uh, now, and the judge applied that test. Um, however, he also applied uh, the test that we find in Article 20 in the alternative. Article 20. Uh, didn't set out, uh, but one, sorry, one three. One three, one three five. Thank you. Three. Yeah, e e this is Article 20, which relates to economic loss. You didn't apply that. Where a claimant has suffered only pure economic loss, um, uh, the test is a B, defendant assumes a responsibility to the claimant, C, the claimant relies on the defendant. And D, it's reasonable for the claim to rely on. Well, I'm sorry, sorry for rising again. Learner went wrong in saying the judge applied this. Below, below, the argument from the claimant was that Article 18 applied yes. and Article 20 didn't. Yeah, well, the judge accepted that. My learner friend would allow didn't. me to make my submissions. But he didn't, he didn't address clear. Article 20 because he accepted the claimant's argument that Article 20 didn't apply. He, 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 That's at paragraph 97 of the judgment. He, he went on to, 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 to deal with it in any event. Uh, anyway, we don't need to argue about that. If my learned friend wanted a more express concession from me, I'm happy to give it. I did say the judge started with Article 18 as the way the case was presented to him. And it was presented to him as an Article 18 case on the basis that it wasn't an economic loss case. We now know that it is an economic loss case, and we know that from the Tulip Trading case, where uh, the court makes clear that a claim of this sort in relation to uh, the loss of Bitcoin is a claim for economic loss, because it's not a claim arising out of injury to person or property. I'm sorry, I'm lost, but I do need clarification. Is my learned friend now saying that the case he's running on appeal is different from the one below? And he's not saying it's Article 18, but Article 20? Because I, I, that's the first time that's, I've understood that to be being suggested. I am saying that. So, so it's a change Absolutely. of case from the one that he ran to the judge? Well, I didn't run it. Uh, the judge, the judge can, it, it doesn't matter, with all due respect. Um, uh, I will address both Article 18 and Article 20. This is a, this is a with respect to a. Uh, well, at uh, well, uh, uh, paragraph 101, the judge says this. The claimants go on to submit that Article 20 is satisfied, presumably on the basis that their contention that BTC is uh, property would not be upheld. So he recognised that there yes. was an alternative submission. Yes. That um, the, that uh, Bitcoin. Were, was not property, uh, uh, and therefore it would be pure economic loss if it was, uh, if it was lost in some if way. If I may assist, 
Um, Article 18 was run as the primary case. Then the defence was Bitcoin isn't property. And, um, and then the alternative case was run um, on the basis of Article 20. So it was, it's either Article 18 and the condition to satisfy, but it isn't Article 18. Um, article 20 satisfied. I'm very grateful. That's exactly how I understood it. Mm. And then at paragraph 97, the judge accepted the primary case. Yes. Which is why he sets out article 17 and 18 and doesn't set out article 20. And I must say, I had not understood that on this appeal, the claimant's primary position, that this was an article 18 case, had been reversed. Yeah, nor, nor had I, I'm afraid. Well, I'll, I'll, um, that may be an appropriate moment to draw stumps, if that's satisfactory. Again, okay. sorry? Uh, that may be an appropriate moment for us to... You want to adjourn for the day? Adjourn for the day, yeah. Okay, that's fine with us. It's 4.21. Uh, I, I how hope, how I'd long? Hope to make, I'd hope to uh, uh, make a little more progress, but I've made sufficient progress for today. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And I will... Uh, Consider the implications of what my learned friend has said overnight and see if it makes any difference to what I was going to say. Um, I, I, I should say, I should I've say seen that a in the list of authorities there is express reference to the paragraph in Tudor Trading which says that this is an economic loss case. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I have seen the reference to Tudor, but I have not read it. I haven't yet had, I think, the. Um, the references, but no, no uh, you the relevant paragraph in Tudor, yes, uh, is um, if you'll give me one moment, I can give it to you. Uh, I think it's there is, in, in the bundle, there are two, uh, there are, there's both the first instance case in which Mrs. Justice Falk gives a very um, uh, uh, useful guidance on a number of matters to do with Bitcoin, including this particular point. The matter then went on appeal, uh, and there the discussion related to um, uh, principally whether or not the claim for breach of fiduciary duty should be struck out or not. Um, Yeah, it's it, it's it's paragraph eighty six. Can you give me the, the number? <coughs> paragraph eighty six of Tulip Trading, um, which uh, you will find at I think uh, page one four zero 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 in the bundle. I, I'm not going to take you back to the facts at this stage, but this is the key point. Um, a further point to keep in mind is that, this, that any loss suffered by TTL is properly characterised as purely economic. There is no element of physical harm to personal property. It follows that no common law duty of care can arise in the absence of a special relationship. That takes you into voluntary assumption of responsibility and, in DIFC terms, Article 20. But, with respect, as I shall briefly summarise for you tomorrow morning, it makes no difference to this case whether you approach it as assumption of responsibility under Article 20, <coughs> there is a clear assumption of responsibility, or whether you adopt the Article 18 three-stage case, uh, foreseeability, clearly established, proximity, clearly established, for proximity, many of the facts that are relevant to assumption of responsibility are the same. That's where the work is done in this case, either under Article 18 under proximity or under Article 20 under voluntary assumption of responsibility. You as a court, uh, I, I mean... You as a, I'm so sorry. No, well, I was just going to say, I mean, we're not bound by this decision. No. Uh, and uh, we may be interested uh, in a situation where there has... where if Bitcoin is property, as the judge found in this case, and it is lost, that uh, that is the equivalent of physical damage to property. Okay. It's gone. I, 
it's, you, you can see the point. Uh, one can see that you can, I mean, if one impaired the value of something, then I can see that may be an economic, economic loss. But if one actually just bolstered away and stole it, um, that's something else again. Well, it's not the same as impairing the value in certain ways, but essentially the theft is an, is an impairment in the value of your property. Well, it's a deprivation, it's, it's a permanent deprivation <laughs> of the property full stop. Well, yeah. so would any economic loss, otherwise you wouldn't recover any damages for it unless it's Well, it's not, an, it's, not, it's not a deprivation of the property, it is an impairment of, 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 of a right. Very well. Well, we, we'll, we'll have to, uh, I'll address that yes. tomorrow morning. Well, yes, because necessary. that's the way the judge, I mean, the, the judge approached it on the basis that this was damage to property. So on on the basis of his judgment, it, it, uh, uh, either he's right or Tudor was right. So we we will have to decide, yeah. won't we, uh, whether we uphold the judge um, or not, or whether we go down the uh, alternative well, route. Uh, unless, that, unless of course, Mr. Hill that's... tells me it's not open on this appeal. Tomorrow. Yes, it's not open, Lord. And I've okay. just been searching through the grounds of appeal and a learning friend skeleton. And this is the first time this point's been raised today. It's an interesting one, though. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm going to approach it on both bases, and I'll try and make some submissions about whether the fact that it is or isn't property makes a difference to the outcome. Because yeah. can I make it clear that uh, this is just as Falk's decision wasn't based on Bitcoin not being property. It was understood that it was a form of property. But what was happening to it was a form of economic loss, not. Uh, well, I'll loss. have to reread Tulip, yes. Tulip. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes. Um, I if you would like some light reading this evening on the bailment issue, yeah. the answer to the paper. Page. That's what the book is about. I'm sorry, you you put your head down, so I can't hear you. Sorry, one five five three nine. Mm -hmm. From section one, it's titled possession, and it deals specifically with the relevance of bailment in a digital assets context. I don't think it uh, is relevant to this appeal, but as I said, the lordship would like some light reading. What, what time do you want to start tomorrow? Could we start at 9? I think you've nine. indicated that. Are you already fine? Yeah. Good, yes. Can we do? So 9, 9 o'clock tomorrow. Nine. So it's not it's not going to be 7 and a half hours more, I've seen. Yeah, can, I, can I just say, I'm, yes. it's coming from my learned friend, these requests to sit late, not from my side. Yeah, of course, I, I should I be hearing be, from you first. <laughs> yes, I know. Can I, it, I just raise one concern, because we have agreed equal time. Yes. And it wouldn't be fair, I think, on this court or anyone to try to sit both early and late. So we should only, I think, have one extra hour tomorrow rather than try to start at nine and sit to five. And, and that would, in my submission, impair my ability to make submissions just because it would be too long a day. Cool. So my learned friend needs to choose either nine or five, subject to whatever's convenient. Well, we can, I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting nine. Okay, we start at nine, we finish at four. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Because Mr. Hill is saying that he's not fair. I would not prefer to start at 10 and finish at 5. But All I, right. I, I well, I, I, I'm not sure I mind either way. Yes, right. Right. Let's, right. let's, let's do 10 till 5. I'm grateful. Now it's 10 till 5 now. Now it's 10 till 5. I'm, we're flip, I'm flipped. I, I would rather start at 9. Okay. Why don't we start at 9.30 and go till 4.30? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start at 9.30 to 4.30 then. 9.30 to 4.30. <laughs> okay, then no more quarter after this. Thank you very With much. a one hour lunch break yes, please. and maybe 10 minutes break in between as well. Okay? So thank you very much indeed. See you. God is adjourned tomorrow. All right.